The United States, Australia, and Sweden battling for gold in the 4x200 freestyle relay. The United States has taken over first place. Brad Schumacher trying to hang on to it as the last United swimmer will hit the pool. He will be Ryan Berube, 22 years old, an outstanding college career at SMU. But it's his responsibility to try to win it for the United States. What a great competitor this Brad Schumacher is turning out to be, boy. He's going to get the United States the lead. Too close to call, though, at this point. Berube into the pool for the United States. Anders Liebring for Sweden. Brian Berube is a 1996 Olympic gold medalist, NCAA Swimmer of the Year, and Texas Hall of Famer. He swam the fourth and final leg of the men's 800 freestyle relay that won USA first place here at home at the Atlanta, Georgia Olympic Games. Now in my opinion, Ryan is the embodiment of an American man. He is inspiringly determined, contagiously proud, and always looking out for his fellow man. In this conversation, Ryan and I talk about all of the crucial moments in his swimming career. He talks about becoming a student of the sport early on. He talks about training his way to the top in age group and in college. And he takes us through that iconic 1996 year where he made the Olympic team at trials, went on to win three NCAA titles, and finished it off with a gold medal at the Olympic Games. Now I'm privileged to call Ryan a training partner a friend, and even a mentor. So I hope you guys enjoy this conversation as much as I had having it, and I hope you walk away from it with something valuable. If you're encouraged to support this podcast, please have a look at the link in the description. With that, my name is Alex Shosda. This is the Shows the Show. Let's begin. Germany. Let's say you got back in the water and you were training for a month, like as hard as you wanted to. Okay. What do you think you could go in a hundred free? So you're talking about racing your son, Jack, since yeah. he's been swimming pretty fast lately. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'd probably be like 48 mid somewhere around there, maybe for a month or two straight. That's my guess. I was 48-4 or maybe a couple of uh, like four or five years ago, and I was kind of training. If I had like some serious training in front of me, I could probably still pull off 48 How something. often do you think you would come? Like five times per week, running doubles? Oh, like a good, like how what would it take for me to get in that kind of shape? Yeah. Yeah, probably five or six workouts a week for six weeks probably. Yeah, because what always blows me away is like I can come every single day for a year straight or run doubles 10 times per week. And I feel like you go on vacation for a month and we'll trade maybe one or two weeks and you show up at practice and you absolutely kick my ass. <laughs> You're just not I doing the right. I want to know how you do it. Yeah, I'm clearly You're not, not doing, doing the right, the right kind of training. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so how'd you get started swimming? Um, I know it was in Florida. Yeah, so I was, uh, you know, I think when you grow up in Florida, you grow up around water all the time. Your parents want you to be safe. And so, um, you know, I did the safety training at like one probably, and then neighbors had pools. So I was playing and swimming from the time I was two on probably in neighborhood pools. And then when I was five, my sister was born in, uh, in the last day of March and swim season opened up in like May or June at the country club. And suddenly I was going to some practice <laughs> Hey Ryan, you want to start? Want to go swimming? Like your sister's killing us, you know. We need a little bit. We need you out of our hair for at least an hour a day. So it's like a daycare. Yeah, it totally was. Yes, and so I showed up, and they told me to swim in lap freestyle, which of course I asked what freestyle was, um, and that was it. So from then on, I was off and running, and um, you know, I was pretty quickly. Uh, I, I was really into racing, so you know, when you're five, six, you're over there in lane one, and I was 
you know, maybe leading my lane, who knows, but I was always keeping an eye out and who was in lane two and lane three and those big kids over there. And whether or not I could actually beat them or not, that was irrelevant. I mean, if we were doing a kick set, I was kicking all out. If we were warming up, I was trying to be them in warm up. So, um, I loved to race people and I still do. That's why, um, Practice is plenty for me because as long as there's good competitive, uh, you know, situations in practice, I, don't, I really don't feel the need to to go and prepare and be ready for a big swim meet um, because, you know, the racing that I get in the pool is plenty. Yeah, I definitely get that, especially in Masters. And I was curious if you always had that competitive edge. Always. So when did you start winning meets? Like what age did it kind of click to you that you were standing out in the crowd? Um. I don't know. I think probably, um, I don't know, eight, nine, somewhere around there. Um, uh, I think even at six, but it's hard to know at six if you're really good, but, um, your parents would probably argue otherwise, but you know, at like eight, nine things started to get interesting. And then at, at 12, I had my first national age group time. You know, I think I was like, uh, 12th in the country in the hundred backstroke when I was 12. And I thought, Oh, that's interesting. So like there's only 11 people faster than me in the whole country that are 12. Huh? So that was kind of the first, um, maybe in, in my memory, the first, you know, realization that maybe I was more than just, um, you know, the, the fastest kid in my, in, you know, in my pool at the country club. Yeah. So w- once you start taking it super serious, were you, cause you started swimming for the country club. Did you progress onto a bigger club team, high school? What did it look like? Yeah. So when we, um, it, it, so the the country club pool was six lane, twenty five yard, unheated. So trying to get through kind of um, the November time frame, which in Florida is always like cloudy and rainy and blowing, um, to get to that kind of pie in the sky uh, meet called the Trophy Meet in Fort Lauderdale the first week of December is oftentimes very very difficult, um, especially when you're like me. You know you got you know, you're little, you're skinny, all of, all of us kids, right? And you got no body fat and you're freezing and I'm playing uh, lizard on the pool deck and in between sets, just a warm up on the concrete uh, because I'm just chattering. And so, um, yeah, so, y- you know, December is probably the end of the season, but you, it probably should be October and the season doesn't start until May. And so, you know, I had six months off in between and my coach knew I needed more and I knew I needed more. So about 12 miles south of us, uh, North Palm Beach Country Club had a 50 meter pool and it was heated. Um, and so that was that was definitely the place where I needed to be. And when we told uh, my club coach, hey, listen, you know, Coach Howard, I think this is what we're going to do. She said, oh, thank goodness. You know, I really think, you know, there's not much more I can do for you here. I think that's the perfect choice for you. So it was amazing. She could have handled it so much differently, and she was so gracious about it. Um, and so moving on to that club team, there were there were guys on that team and girls going to Olympic trials. So that was a whole different type of environment uh, for me. So I started with a B team, um, uh, and that was coached by uh, a guy named Walt Dykert. And Coach Dykert was awesome. Um, he was so grouchy on the outside and prickly to the kids. Um, and he would just bark at them. And the second everybody pushed off, if you were like a spectator, he'd turn around and just giggle at you. Like, I think I got him right where I want him now. They're afraid. Um, He didn't really want us to be afraid. He just wanted us to listen to him, you know. And uh, it was kind of funny. I think later on I found out that um, that the lifeguards used to come out and they would make him as bourbon and coke. Because we practiced five thirty to seven, and he would bring his bourbon and coke at around six o'clock, and I never knew that for like ten years afterwards. Um, but he he was but what Coach Dykert was was an amazing technician, and he had an eye for detail. And um, I had this meet when I was uh, thirteen years old. I just aged up. Um, in December, and our first long course meet was at Pinecrest in Fort Lauderdale, and it was probably May. And I stood up on the blocks, 13, probably, you know, five foot six, five foot seven, you know, 110 pounds soaking wet if I'm lucky. And uh, on the blocks next to me, some of the 400 freestyle was a guy named Chris McAllister. And Chris was like maybe a year older, 
but I hadn't seen him because we hadn't been training the same time or, you know, um, competing at the same time with each other. And there's Chris on the, on the wall, on the blocks. And he's like 5'11". He's got massive pecs. He's got hair on his chest. He's got big guns and probably weighed 165 or 170 pounds. And I was like, oh my gosh, how am I going to compete with that? So we dive in the water I streamline out and I take my first breath to the right and I'm just looking at his suit. So it was a half a body length behind 10 yards into the race. And that's kind of how the rest of the race went. I hit the wall, I turned and all I saw was bubbles. And so I got knocked down a couple of steps that day after thinking I was pretty good when I was 12 uh, with that national age group time. And so, um, so I was kind of depressed for a week or two and I kept thinking to myself, how am I going to beat Chris McAllister? Am I going to be, I'm never going to be taller than him in my 13 year old mind. I'm never going to be stronger than him. I'm never going to be heavier than him. How on earth can I beat Chris McAllister? And the answer I came up with was it had to be technique and to control what I could control because I couldn't control my size or my weight or my strength at that time. And so, um, that's, so, so that's the moment that I really started to think about, all right, why is coach Tiger giving us these drills? Why are we doing this exactly? So I would stop and I would ask him, why are we, why, why, what, what is this doing for us? And I'm sure he was like, you know, get back in the water, do what I tell you to do at first. But I think he realized that eventually that I was trying to become a student of the sport. And so we spent a little bit more time, a little bit more time uh, than he did with everybody else, kind of explaining and probably like just, you know, humoring me um, and my questions. But that was a moment. And so um, within a year, I was swimming faster than Chris. Um, and a year after that, um, I was making juniors and a year after that I was making my first seniors, uh, in Olympic trials kind of one on top of the other. So it went pretty quickly, um, from about 13 and a half onwards. I had a little, a little bit of a lull in there at 13 where I did, you know, where I plateaued out, but that was really kind of that moment where I, I started to focus more. And then, um, I think you were asking about like, when did it really happen? Right when did you really think that 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 was going to turn? And it happened when I um I well I made my first short course I made my first juniors, um, and I went to Buffalo, New York, and swam uh, at this make at this crazy pool there, um, and that was interesting. But then the next the next year I went to Cleveland in the spring, and it was cold. It was horrible, and I swam the thousand, and I got second and I went like 911 something like that um and the thousand is like just turned 16 and I made my first Olympic trials cut and that was really cool um and then the next juniors that summer was actually at Mission Bay in Palm Beach County so like an hour from home um and I swam the 400 IM I got third in the 400 IM at juniors and swam fast enough to make the national junior team um at that time frame, you had to swim a certain time standard, just like you do today, um, relative to the top 16 kids in the country. And so I made my first trip and we, they, we went out to Colorado Springs and got to train out there. They didn't have the facility out there. So you basically stayed in the dorms, the military dorms. Um, they had a flume, which was really cool to swim in. And then we got to go train at the Air Force Academy. Hey, you got to educate me. What's a flume? Oh, oh, sorry. <clears throat> so it's basically you just, uh, it's a pool that's six feet wide and 10 feet long and four feet deep and they run water through it at a constant speed. Oh, water treadmill. Type yeah, deal. so water treadmill. So you swim in the same place. They had a window on the side and where they could video you and do all this stuff. So that was cutting edge technology um, in 19, whatever that was, uh, 1989. Um, something like that. So that was really cool. And then we went to Air Force Academy, which is at like, I want to say it's at, I'll have to look, it might be 7,200 feet. Uh, and it says something, it tells you on the wall and it says where the air is rare. It's amazing. It's really cool. Um, and then, so we did this camp and then we went and we traveled as a team to Vancouver, Canada and got to wear USA swimming sweats and got to do USA swing, you know, USA chants and cheers. And I came away from that thinking, I want more of that. 
it doesn't matter what we do, what I do, or where you tell me to go, or how hard it's going to be. I, I want more of that. So that was kind of the, the the kickoff of the super super duper serious Ryan was about sixteen and a half or seventeen years old. Right, and it sounds like you kind of had three super characteristics. One, you were super competitive. Two, you were willing to be super technical about it and kind of putting in the time to understand it. And then three, you had super big ambitions. But on the backside of that, how'd you deal with loss if you had a meet where you didn't really swim so fast? So I can see a lot of kids in that kind of position, especially at that age, it's easy to overthink things or get down on yourself, to doubt yourself. Did you ever deal with that? No, it is. It's super easy because you you sit there and you're like, well, I thought I did okay. I thought I trained well. I thought I put my cap on right, tied my suit right, and got my head right. Um, but you know, there's no there's no quite equalizing sport really is swimming. Is there? I mean, you get out of it what you put into it. So if you think you put everything into it um, and you didn't get the result that you wanted, um, you have to ask yourself some really hard questions. And that's when it's important to be honest with yourself about what's happening. And if you don't know the answers, then you've got to ask other people and be willing to take whatever answer that is, um, whatever they have to say without getting upset about it. And so, um, you know, I think I had those moments and um, I can remember riding back in the car and my my dad telling me, you know, it, you know, it looked like you were out there for a Sunday stroll, Ryan, you know, and they had like spent the day, you know, the weekend and gone down there and driven a long way and spent a lot of money and on hotels and the whole family got put on pause to watch me swim. And um, I remember being really upset when he, when he told me that. And it probably in retrospect could have been, uh, conveyed in maybe a little bit more constructive fashion, but um, you know, it was it was a little bit of a wake up call. Like, why are we going to do this if you're not going to have every last ounce of energy into into excelling and being your best? And so, um, it was it was a lesson learned. I feel like in that in that respect. Um, but I think you know, to, back to your question, like, what do you what do you, how do you handle those things? Um, I think being honest with yourself and just really digging in and seeing if a, if a this is a physiological thing, is this a training issue? Is it was I sick? Did I have you know was it a technique issue, right? Or was this a mental preparation issue, right? There's there's kind of a couple of different ways you can go with it if you don't perform as well as you think you're supposed to, or, you know, let's just say, you know, you're a 5,500 freestyler and you go to a meet expecting going 56 cause you're not shaved and you are 57. And I'm like, huh, that's weird. You know, I was, I was 56 three months ago. Why did I go 57 here? It's not that you necessarily swim slow. You just didn't swim the way you expected. So <clears throat> it is a learning opportunity for you to say, all right, why did I swim this way and try and unlock that that riddle. So I don't know. I think that's why swimmers are so in generally in general, they're a lot smarter individual. They're introspective. They have the ability to look into themselves and see flaws and recognize that and try and correct those flaws, maybe more than uh, the general population, because they have to, they, they have to look inside themselves if they want to be the best. If they're willing to just let somebody else tell them, what's going to happen. And if they're fine, not performing the way that they thought they were going to perform and just keep banging their head against the wall, hoping for a different result. Well, you're going to get the same result. So the definition of madness. So I don't know, it, it's a hard thing to learn, right? When you're 13 or 14 years old, how to take that, um, the input, even when it might not be welcome and learn something about yourself. But I think if there's any message in the sport of swimming, it's that you can continue to improve um, yourself, be it in the water or outside the water, if you're open to being introspective and looking at yourself and asking yourself those hard questions and being able to allow other people to answer those hard questions for you when you may not know the answer. Yeah. Did you have any tools in your pocket for going through that process? Like maybe training journals, writing down notes of how you felt through practices, leading through tapers at meets, or maybe somebody in your family who's just really good at talking to you, giving you feedback, a coach, teammates? 
You know, on that on the soft, I I think of that as the soft side of things, right? I mean, there's the hard side of things where my mom, who was like the bookkeeper in my dad's business, was like every so meet she had the clipboard and the grid, and she had on the left hand side all your best times and the splits from those best times, and then like she had ten columns. Uh, right where for this meet she'd write in it up top and then write in your splits underneath and you could quickly compare the two right in the days before swim swam and um and oh, meet yeah. mobile I think I might have been telling you my mother was an accountant <laughs> so she did the exact same thing but yes. in Excel yeah and I mean she had all of the individual cuts for every <laughs> single event that I would race and she had the formulas put in there so if she put my time it would show exactly how much I was missing to get a time on the other ones so it's just like a huge report after which every is pretty meet. cool, right? That's the hard oh, yeah. analytics that are really helpful as you're trying to figure out, okay, what's going on. Um, those are great, but I, you know, honestly, I didn't have a ton of amazing tools on the soft side of that. My my parents weren't great at communicating. I wasn't really that great at communicating. Um, I'd say my coaches, Walt Dykert was really good at probably telling you what he saw. Um, but my next coach, um, to Kavanaugh, he was good too, but he was more about letting you figure it out. You know, he wasn't like a man of many words when it came to things. He'd say, all right, well, yeah, do this, do that. All right, good. And that was like all the, all the prep you got, you know, heading into it. And at some point when I was like 16 years old or 17, I think I was a junior going into my junior year. Um, I kind of got antsy is I think a lot of kids do and maybe as maybe I don't know maybe it's just me but as a 16 year old boy I wanted more feedback you know more it's more about me more me 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 and so like I wanted my coach to say well Ryan like on this event I want you to do this I want you to go out this fast I want you to be feeling like this and then bring it home here and we really what we're looking for is for you to nail this turn here and streamline off the wall but like I wanted the over analysis preparation and that was not Coach Kavanaugh, right? He was doing all the preparation in the pool, making sure you were ready um, and wanted to kind of let you figure it out because he knew everybody was different. And that just really wasn't his strength was to getting you like mentally all like teed up and prepared. So we did it ourselves. Um, and that may or may not have been the right answer. Um, I think it probably, I probably could have been further ahead with my times and with my progression had I had that soft benefit, but I really didn't growing up. Yeah, is that something you were looking for when you were starting to look at colleges, if you wanted to swim in college? I was. I guess while you're on it, I guess you were in a position where you're swimming on national teams, representing USA, swimming really fast, going to Olympic trials, getting noticed. What did your whole recruiting process look like? <laughs> well, what I knew that I wanted to accomplish um, – in, in in looking for a college was, you know, having this environment where I was the only kid on the team at the time making Olympic trials. Uh, there was one other girl making nationals, uh, Lisa Martin. And she was a distance swimmer and she was great. But, you know, all of us, and I'll, I'm taking a step back here, but all of us trained on the, nat, on the A team of, of our swim team in high school for the same two events. We all trained for the 500 free and the 400 IM. Didn't matter whether you were a sprint butterfly or you'd have been a world of hurt, um, right? But like that was who you, that was what you trained for. And so coach's philosophy, coach Dyker or coach Kavanaugh's philosophy was, I don't know what you're going to turn into, but I'm preparing you to be great post high school. And if I give you a great aerobic base and I give you a great stroke and technique base, then however you grow and however your body eventually fills out and whatever your ligaments, however they stretch, I'm going to allow you to be good at whatever that, that body um, allows you to be good at. And so the result was is that we were never bored, right? And we were always doing different things and, and different strokes and different strategies, and, um, and we were really, really well prepared aerobically. But what we didn't have was a really like strong team traveling with you here and there. And there wasn't like this, um, the competitiveness. I mean, my competitiveness was, uh, had to be kind of relegated to when we swam 500s, uh, you know, we would, I would do X number of 500s on, I don't know, pick a time on 520 or 515 or something. Um, and I would go 500s and Lisa would go 450s. 
And that was like, so it was my my goal to pass her by the time I got to the 500 before she hit the wall with the 450. So that was a, for such a competitive guy, that was a really difficult situation to be in. So reverting back to kind of what were you looking for college-wise, I was looking for a team that was going to challenge me. There were going to be guys right and left that were better than me that I could go chase as opposed to always being the one kind of being chased in practice now. Um, that competitiveness, man, I just, just, just chomping at the bit. Um, and so, and to have a great team feel and not people that I didn't really get along with. So the team feel was number one, um, and having a great team was number two. And so as it turned out, um, you know, SMU's coach and the coaching staff was critical and important as well. So Eddie was kind of, Eddie, uh, Senate, um, is like a dad, right? And he'd kind of bring in, he's sometimes he gets a little surly or a little growly, you know, and, um, he's, he's awesome. And he made me feel right at home. And he made me feel like he was a hundred percent vested in, in what I was trying to accomplish both individually and then as a team. And he really brought a great soft touch to it. So he was great. And then, Greg Rodenbaugh was the assistant coach, and he was definitely more of kind of like the Coach Cavanaugh driver, um, always pushing, you know, the taskmaster, paying attention to numbers and percentages, and he was very analytical and things. So they made a really good team together um, as a coaching staff. And then probably the last thing that you that you didn't know, I mean, is as I'm recruited as a 400 ammer and a 500 freestyler um, in high school, I could swim at 200 IM as well. Um, pretty well. And, um, but like, but, uh, I was the, the, S, the Jeff Vance had won the phone I am the year before as a junior at SMU. So I was going to get to go train with the NCAA champion in the foreigner I am in my events, right? My senior year, I was, or his senior year, my freshman year, I was so psyched about that opportunity to challenge myself. So, um, that was, that was kind of what I was looking for, and SMU really ended up being the right fit as a, from a team perspective, and then academically, it was a very good fit. And I, and I grew up in a team, I'm sorry, in a school with 52 kids in my graduating class, so going to a UT or a Michigan or a, even a Florida really wasn't very attractive to me, and SMU's campus really made a ton of sense. So it was a really good fit, and, and personally, I feel like Texas... Uh, speaks to me uh, as a human being from a characteristic standpoint, so uh, from a character standpoint. So it, there was a lot of things going for, for Dallas and for SMU. Right. You mentioned uh, the team really won you over mm. a couple of times. What would you say makes a really good teammate? And how did those guys at SMU help you develop? Well, I think having diversity of perspectives and diversity of approaches and diversity of character um, is uh, of characteristics of of your personality. I think that's probably a different personalities is probably the best thing for making a really strong team. If everybody's all the same, um, if everybody's the same size and this has the same style stroke and has the same approach to life. It gets kind of boring. So I think having the the spice of life was pretty important. And there was a lot of spice going on on this yeah. new team. Oh, my gosh. I mean, I came in. We had a massive class my freshman year. We had, um, we had a guy from uh, Connecticut who had a long ponytail, looked like a hippie, and then ended up going on to teach um, to teach music, right, the rest of his life. And he's amazing at it. Steve's amazing at it. Steve Pierce. Um we had um, we had the preacher's son who had never seen an R-rated movie, you know. Um, we had we had uh, you know Vladimir Pulikev who was a Russian um, straight out of the straight out of the I guess Soviet Union or I guess Russia at the time in ninety ninety two right kind of right there on the wall yeah, still, right and um, I mean he was like twenty years old and could drink a fifth of vodka like you know with no problem you know so I mean we had all these different guys together and it was always exciting and it was always fun that was just a freshman class. So that was what made it fun is all these different personalities. Yeah. So, I mean, you're coming to college, you're super serious about swimming. You kind of touched on having some crazy guys on the team. So were you a troublemaker in college? How'd you balance being super strict and super dedicated to swimming, but also having some fun on the side? Yeah. So I probably got more easygoing with time at school. <laughs> so like, 
I brought the same the same really intense approach to my freshman year. And that was really fun and I had a great time. But, you know, I didn't I didn't really drink. That wasn't my thing. And so I didn't do any of that my freshman year. And I think um, the guys on the team were like, who is this guy? He's young. He's probably cocky. You know, I mean, I I, I, uh, I narrowly avoided the cocky freshman award. Um, and then my so- my sophomore year at Drylands, which is the beginning of the year, kind of an internal team bonding event where kind of everybody resets. Um, I earned the title of uh, the SAC award, um, which stands for self-appointed captain, which was not intended as a compliment. (laughs) You know, but like the crazy thing happened my freshman year is that all these seniors had just finished with the Olympic trials. And in their minds, like that was their chance. They were trying to make the Olympic team and they finished with a really, really good year, their junior year, the year of the Olympics in 92, they didn't make the team. And so like the next year, 93 was kind of a letdown. It was like, uh, all right, well, there was the pinnacle opportunity of our careers. And now it's our senior year. You know what? Let's all make sure we have fun guys. And so there was a little bit too much of the, hey, let's make sure we have fun for me that freshman year. And then quite frankly, they were probably having a little bit too much fun as the seniors. And so I wasn't a massive fan of that. I was trying to drive and that 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 uh, that fire was really, really burning hot inside of me. And so I was not one to be distracted by some things that uh, that, that group was being distracted by. So by the time sophomore year came around, it was more the same. And most of the best guys on the team that were the highest placing at NCA, they were seniors, so they were all moving off. And my freshman year, I had gotten um, two sevenths and a ninth as a freshman at NCAs. So, like, I was like the highest scoring athlete returning as a sophomore. So I kind of looked at it like, okay, well, those guys are gone. I'm back. I'm the high point scorer. Like, okay, y'all just lead by example, right? And that didn't really go over all that well <laughs> with some of the juniors and seniors. So I got the SAC award, um, well-deserved, and uh, kind of, you know, I, that's still my nickname when I talk to some of my older classmen, um, which is now a term of love and endearment, of course. Um, but yeah, so yeah, that was a, it was an interesting um, evolution uh, that first, first or second year. And, I, and then I think, um, I've gained a little maturity and an understanding on how to deal with like the, the two prongs, right? Having fun as a group and still doing the right thing and being dedicated to your sport. And, you know, I mean, swimmers play hard and they work hard, right? The, really the, the other, and the other, um, priority order, they work really, really hard and then they play hard. And I learned that you could do both within reason. And, um, you know, with a little temperament on the play hard at times. And so um, I, I felt like that junior and senior year were really me hitting my stride. That's I think probably everybody is in college, right? They take a couple of years to figure it out. And I mean, you clearly did senior year winning NCAAs, going to Olympic trials, making the team. Yeah. Well, you know, I think the important thing for people to remember is that before that senior year, I had my junior year and I had my sophomore year and those didn't necessarily go great, right? Like two sevenths and a ninth freshman year. And the thing that I got seventh in, uh, in a 200 backstroke, my freshman year, a hundred backstroke, my freshman year, I ended up ninth, my sophomore year slipped off the wall on the start and just couldn't make it back in the morning to, you know, to make it into finals swam really fast at night, but still it was ninth. It was a disappointment in my head that I hadn't performed worse my sophomore year than I had my freshman year. And then junior year, I was lucky enough to make Pan American Games, and they happened to be in between uh, conference and NCAAs in Argentina. And so I flew down there, um, and coach, uh, you know, both the coaches, Sin and and Rodenbaugh were like, no, no, you're, you're not not going. This, you're representing your country. You're going. And so off I went and had a great time, swam really fast, came back super focused and ended up sitting next to a guy, um, uh, a diver from the University of Miami on the flight back from Argentina. And I saw him like three days later at NCAAs. And the very first day I'm walking in, he's walking out and he told me, oh, I just got over the flu. 
I was like, really? That's crazy. I feel fine. And then I blew chunks that night, you know, and so I was kind of sick the first two days and I had a crappy first and second day. And then that third day, uh, I was starting to feel a little bit better and I ended up having getting third in the 200 backstroke as a, as a junior. So it was another kind of disappointing year where I th- really thought I was going to pop my junior year and it didn't happen. So it was kind of all culminating in that senior year, like that frustration. And it's like, all right, it's time. This is my time. I know I can do it. Like I only got one year left. And so um, it's funny me, me saying that, um, Alex, I got like goosebumps thinking about that emotion. It's weird, but I, 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 I think about things sometimes and it, and it becomes um, really intense, those emotions. Yeah, it's almost like you're putting yourself back in time and yeah. reliving it. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, I mean, I think good athletes have a, have, are really skillful at um, visualizing. And that was a really new thing <laughs> 25 years ago. People talked about it, but I, I think I, I, I took it to heart and did a lot of that. And we can talk about that in a minute. But, um, you know, I think that senior year, there was a lot leading up to it. And so when I sat down that September of my senior year, and I sat down with Coach and we went through kind of the goal plan, which he was really big about writing down the goals both in the water, um, in school, and socially. And, uh, and you know, I said, all right, I, I want to win all three of my events at NCAAs um, and make the Olympic Games. And these are the times that I think I've got to go in order to do that. And I don't think it surprised him. I think his eyes probably opened up a little bit because he's like, man, this kid wants to do that. You know, maybe, I don't know if, if he ever felt any um, pressure, like, ooh, this year, these are his goals. I got to make sure I give him the ammunition he needs to succeed. I don't know. I'll have to ask Eddie about that. Um, I guess, how did you respond to his response? I just kind of knowing yourself as an athlete, what kind of support do you do the best with? Yeah, I mean, he was like, okay. His response was, all right. Didn't so even flinch. didn't even flinch. And he's like, all right, here's the plan. Here's what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to proceed for a semester. Um, you're not going to really even taper for a conference meet. Um, uh, and then, well, well actually I, I'm trying to think how that went. You're not really going to taper or shave for the conference meet. Um, but Olympic trials. So basically how it worked is, as I recall this, because Olympic trials was the first week of March, and NCAAs was the last week of March. We normally would have had our conference meet when NCA when the conference was. So they moved conference forward two weeks to like middle second or third week of uh, February. So we swam the conference meet then, and I like no shave, no taper, and like okay, so that's the plan, and then we'll have you ready for Olympic trials the first week of March and then we'll work for another week or, you know, another week and then we'll have you ready again for NCs. Like, cause there, there, there was a lot of swimming in a relatively short period of time, um, to be ready for. So it's okay, great. And, you know, anyway, so, um, we had this plan, right. All put together this very kind of detailed plan and right, let's see, right before finals of, fall semester. It was like the second week of December. We had a long course meet at UT, which was like the last warm up before trials that was long course. So, you know, you're not usually swimming long course in December. And I went down there and I had a sinus infection, like starting four days before the meet. And me and antibiotics do not agree, at least relative to how I feel and when I swim, I just feel terrible. And I went, man, I went down there and I swam the first day and I think I went 159, 200 freestyle, like terrible, right? And I was so beaten down. I swam a couple other events and swam terribly. And my mind was just completely blown. And I walked over to coach after the meet and he goes, well, Ryan, I don't think I need to see you swim like that anymore. <laughs> I think you need to get on a plane home tomorrow morning. Just go home. Don't worry about it. Shake it off. Finish your finals. Go home, you know, for Christmas. Come back and we'll be ready to go. Like, stick with the plan. We have a plan. And that was like the the mantra for the next week or two is like, stick with a plan. This is a blip on the, on the radar. Stick with a plan. I think that's a really good, you know, I think lesson for a lot of people out there is just because you get a blip on the radar, like, look at it. Okay. 
I do feel like crap. I had a bad swim. Why do I have a bad swim? Well, it could be any one of these three things, but it's got to be one of them. Okay, well, that doesn't mean we alter our plan. That doesn't mean you have to get completely mind blown over this. Like, take a deep breath, reset, keep your eye on the ball, control what you can control, move forward. And I think that's been one of the big things I've been working on for my boys or for our boys is just to have that conversation and be like, okay, like stuff's going to happen. Take a deep breath, control what you can control. Don't worry about the rest of it. And um, definitely helps you set in a little bit. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So you got sent home to UT. How did you deal with with it at that time? I mean, were you kind of in the slumps or I think I was in your senior year. Did you kind of already see enough that you can manage yourself, hold your discipline, keep training, buckle down to conference? Yeah, I think I think I was probably in the dumps for like two or three days and then was mature enough to be able to go, okay. Fine. You know, I think I probably got over the ana- the sinus infection, came off the antibiotics, started to feel just a little bit better in practice, and then was like, of course, of course, of course, of course, it's fine. And so, um, yes, yeah, kind of got myself dialed back in and uh, went to conference, had a really fast conference for not being shaved or rested. Um, and that was the first, that was the first uh, meet ever held at Texas A&M. Uh, at the current pool. So that was pretty cool. And, um, and then like two weeks later I was at trials and interestingly, I jumped in the water at the outdoor pool at SMU two days before we left, maybe the day before we left, left Sunday, we left Sun, uh, Sunday is when this happened. Monday, we flew to Indianapolis and I swam Wednesday. So just to give you a sense when this happened. So I dove in the water and I did something to my neck and I displaced something with my vertebra and I swam 25 yards and I couldn't turn my neck to the side to breathe. So I literally had to stop swimming, hang on to the lane line and like kind of nurse and kick on my back to get back to the end of the pool and got out and didn't swim and just started immediately with like, you know, just stem. And I didn't have an amazing, um, you know, PT that I was working with at the time. It was more chiropractor work. And um, I just, and I was really scared messing with something with my neck. And so um, crazy, Uh, it was crazy. And so flew to Indianapolis, was able to swim the next day, but with immense amount of pain. The next day, a little bit less pain. So I shaved that night, like hoping that I could go the next day and would be okay. And I dove in the next morning and was fine. Like could you know, a a one or two on the pain scale, nothing that was going to keep you from performing. So, so fortunate, um, for that. So I came into the meet, I think seated, seated eighth or ninth, something like that. Um, knowing that I had to be top six to make the team. And I thought I was going to have to go 149.5 is what I felt like I would have to go to be sure of making it. And that was kind of based on, um, the previous two Olympics, uh, in Olympic trials, and then kind of how I saw it was what was happening um, with the pool. And so <clears throat> I swam that morning and went like one, I went like one, th- what did I go? I went 149.3, I want to say, um, and was uh, second seed <laughs> going into finals that night. And I was like, Oh, so this isn't necessarily about just getting sixth now. Maybe this is about winning. And so uh, that really changed my perspective being in the middle of the pool in lane five next to um, Josh Davis and uh, John Piersma and Joe Hudapol. And so um, we swam that night. And uh, it's a great race at the 150. At the 175, there were like four guys dead even. And John Piersma just bared down from Michigan and was 148.9. Um, and Josh Davis was second with a 149.1, and I was third with a 149.2. So uh, got better from morning to night. Probably didn't have my best swim, but it was a really, really good swim. And yes, I missed out on swimming the 200 freestyle at the Olympics, but crazy, that hadn't been my goal. I don't think that meant that that had any reason why I didn't get second, but it was just kind of so interesting how your life changes 
in one swim and you're like, I hope I can get sixth. And then your perspective, and you're like, oh, maybe I can win this thing. So that was really, really fun. Um, and life obviously changed a lot in that moment and kind of being that dark horse little guy that weighs, you know, 165 pounds and is 5'11". Um, you know, there's two guys smaller than me on the Olympic team. So uh, that was, it was definitely kind of out of left field for some people, maybe not necessarily the people closest to me, but, um, but for some. So it was, um, it was amazing and uh, kind of went on and I, I got, uh, I swam a couple more events and I ended up getting, my best event was a 200 backstroke. I ended up getting fourth. Um, uh, I was number six in the world, but I was number four in the U S with the best time two double odd, almost flat, like in two double Oh two, two double Oh four or something like that. Um, but you know, that, that meant, you know, you're darn lucky you're made it in the 200 back or 200 freestyle. So, um, so yeah, so then, uh, like two weeks later I went to NSA's and, um, one, you know, swim the 200 I am, that was the one I was most concerned about. If you don't mind. Yeah. You said you were. You made the Olympic team before swimming NCAA, so you're walking into the college championship meet knowing that you already have a spot on the Olympic team. Yeah. Right? And you were awarded the SAC award at SMU, <laughs> so clearly you have a lot of confidence. <laughs> what was going on in your head Well, at I mean, you, you, and how did you manage that? Well, like, you pretty it's super watched. easy to, to have a really big head. Yeah, you walk into NC's with a lot of confidence, right? Um, but in the back of your mind, you can't help but hearing that that voice that's like, yeah, but like, yeah, all these expectations are on you now and everybody's gunning for you. Right. And you swam great two weeks ago. Did you hold your taper together for, or, you know, three weeks ago, did you hold your taper together for three weeks? I don't know. I've never actually been through a meat cycle like that. So there were a lot of unknowns still. So you just kind of keep your head down, keep your focus, just get a smile in your, in your minds, maybe every time you go to practice and you know, you're, you're ripping off a couple of pace fifties or hundreds and you're like, that felt good, you know? And so coming in with a lot of confidence, I think, I think the 400 I am was definitely, I felt like going to be a bigger challenge for me. Um, just because it's got brushstroke in it and it stinks for me. So, uh, I figured out how to, how to fake it. And I, I, actually passed a couple of people didn't have the worst split in the pool um on that in that race and uh ended up winning i went like 144 8 uh which none of my times were like you know american records or anything but they were pretty quick relative to american records um and then the next day swam um 100 backstroke um one over neil walker which is kind of funny because i was 46 one to win over neil walker by maybe three tenths or something he was only a sophomore i was a uh, he was a freshman or sophomore i guess he was a sophomore i was a senior the very next year he goes 44 nine to lead off the 400 medley relay um breaks his hand finishing on the wall the first day of the meet so he didn't swim the next he didn't swim the hunter backstroke the next year but like to me, how lucky are you from time, from a timing perspective, right? And I've always remembered that in life that so much of it is about timing. You can prepare, you can do everything you can possibly do, but you never know, it might be 1980 and you might not even make the Olympic Games, right? Um, you might peak, you might be at your absolute best, um, you know, two, in, in the gap year, two years in between, um, you know, Olympic years. So just because you do all that preparation doesn't necessarily mean any, and you don't succeed, you don't achieve that Olympic medal or you don't win at JOs or whatever it might be, you know, a lot of life is about timing and it's not necessarily your fault. It's just kind of how the chips fall. Um, there's a amazing athlete named Michelle Griglione who, uh, swam at Florida. Um, I, th oh, she swam at Florida and I think she swam West coast as well. I think she did her, her grad work at Florida. Um, but she, she uh, missed three Olympic teams in the 200 butterfly. She got third, three Olympiads, Olympic trials in a row by like a total of maybe two tenths of a second, maybe a little bit less. So like she, if there's anybody in, 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 uh, on the planet who understands kind of like being humble and it would be her, especially given that she had won multiple world championships in years in between. I think she had set the world record in between and she just, 
for whatever reason on those three Olympic days, Olympic trials days, it didn't work out. But um, she learned a heck of a lot from it, I think, and took an amazing amount from it. And as a person, she's so centered and she happens to be like a rocket, a real rocket scientist. She's smart as a whip and amazing, amazing person and um, just fun to hang around. But like, that's a, that's a side note. But I think it's important to remember that timing is everything, and that, which is why I told this story about Neil Walker. You know, I mean, um, being in the position that I was, there was a lot of luck um, to go along with the training and preparation. So, um, yeah, so we won won that night. Um, we went swim on the inner freestyle relay. I think we got um, like fourth, which is pretty cool. And then the next day you're tired, right? I think I'm swimming the 200 backstroke and the 400 free relay. I think it was like the 12th and 13th um, swim of the three-day weekend. And so, you know, that last day is all about sore and who can fight through feeling sore and, and horrible um, to swim your best times. And so um, I swam against Brad Bridgewater, who would go on to win the Olympic gold medal that year. Um, and, you know, I had this one crazy thing. I don't know if I ever told you this, but um, I realized, uh, Alex, that, you know, doing things that other people weren't necessarily willing to do would differentiate you and give you opportunities. And so for me, my freshman year, I got in my mind that I was going to kick, I was going to be prepared to kick seven or eight kicks, eight kicks off the wall on the last lap of a 200 backstroke. A little bit easier to do on a 100 backstroke. And kids these days are doing so much more um, than, than, than I did. But back then, that was relatively new. I mean, Burkhoff did his blast off in 88 um, and kicked out 35 meters uh, on 100 backstroke at the Olympic Games. Um, but nobody was doing it like at the end of races, right? You would come up off the wall but at the flags. So I started training for that and training for that and training for that. And so, um, you know, my senior year, I turned at the wall and I kicked off I, I turned even with Brad and he was a tuner backstroker. He was actually like a 500 backstroker. He would have been amazing at the 500 backstroke. And so I had turned in front of him at the hundred. He had caught me by the 150, and we turned together at the 175 and I kicked off eight kicks and beat him by like three or four tenths of a second. So like when you look at my career, there's so many people that could have and maybe should have beat me along the way. And for whatever reason, I kind of ended up where I was. And some of it was luck and some of it was timing and some of it was just being prepared um, where others might not have been or it wasn't their day. And so um, and so I finished off that NCAAs actually with my favorite swim of my entire career, uh, which was a 400 freestyle relay. And we ended up, uh, we were leading through like 385 yards of the race and uh, only got nipped at the end um, uh, by Auburn. So, uh, you know, we've never let Enrico Lynch here uh, forget that, of course. And he, he he goes back, I think he thinks about that that moment more often than I do, um, about, about, about uh, you know, those last 15 meters. But there was no question that we all left it all in the water. And we did the best that we could. And we ended up as silver medalists at the NCAAs as a team. And that was like my favorite race ever. It was amazing. So um, it's pretty cool. Um, you know, and that was a really short. So I, I just gave you like 15 minutes worth of a conversation, right? I was telling a story that really only lasted like six weeks. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But no, you're doing a great job. It's funny because I've prepared all these questions of things like what set you apart from the pack? doing crafty things like working your eight dolphin kicks on the end of the two backstroke. I don't even have to ask the questions. I've done this once or twice before. Yeah, you can yeah. definitely tell. <laughs> but all right, so you're going through, you've won three first place uh, finishes at NCAAs. You're kicking butt, scored Olympic trials, and you're pretty dialed in on the plan that you have. What's it like training for the Olympic Games compared to training on club or training in college? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think the easy question is to say, ah, it doesn't really change any. But, you know, there's a reason that USA Swimming moved the Olympic trials from three and a half months before the Olympics to three weeks before the Olympics. And it's because it's really difficult, I think, thing to deal with 
is knowing you've just made the Olympic team. It's been your lifelong dream to have made the Olympic team. Um, and then you realize that dream. And <clears throat> in my case, I had three and a half months. I had from like the first week of March to the third week of July to like prepare myself, which in a lot of ways was awesome, right? Because up until then, I had been focused on like four events, three events, right? As I was swimming at a race, plus all your relays and things. And then I had three and a half months to do nothing but focus on four lengths of a 50 meter pool, which was really, really cool. Um, and I started doing a ton of visualization in that time frame, and got to the point where, um, you know, I would be laying in bed and think, and like the, the race would pop into my head. And I, there I am trying to go to sleep, and my heart rate is suddenly like 165, 170 beats a minute. I'm sweating, right? I mean, that's the kind of like visualization that you want. You want to have a physiological response to what's going on in your head, and that takes practice. Um, but I was really glad that I had that practice because I, I really, by the time I got to the Olympics and I swam in the games, we can talk about that, but like I was really mentally prepared for that final race of my career. Um, so I was glad I had that time, um, but I was a pretty disciplined and focused guy and not all 45 or 50 athletes on the team are that focused and disciplined, believe it or not. Um, they can be focused or disciplined for a period of time and then there's always going to be a handful that for whatever reason lose focus um, and show up in the meet not as prepared as they should be. <clears throat> and we had one of those in the 200 freestyle as well, our year. Um, <clears throat> and I think that he just got his head wrapped around the fact that he was an Olympian and people were telling him that he was awesome. And I think he was doing a ton of interviews and it got to his head. And I just think he got distracted um, with uh, all the things that, you know, uh, a world-class athlete can be distracted with. And so um, nowadays there's three weeks and you finish and it is literally like you leave trials and you stay in a hotel and you don't go home and you go to the training camp and you you know that when you go to trials, you bring the stuff that you need for the next like four weeks of your life. And so um, it's a, I think, I do think it's a better thing um, than, than leaving three and a half months to athletes to figure it out. And it's a more, much more controlled environment. Right. And I mean, with those super high expectations and the way you approach it, was fear ever an element for you? Did you ever get scared that something might not work out? that your expectations were too high or was it all just happening so fast in three weeks that you didn't even have time to think about it? No. Well, I mean, it was three and a half months for me. Um, so I, I think that there was plenty of time to have that fear, you know, uh, voice stick its, stick its nose into your thought process. Um, but I think people that know me know that that fear isn't something that motivates me. I think, Stress actually is something that's good for me, um, and it kind of it's the fire that cuts everything out. That's it's a weird way of saying that, but um, <clears throat> I'll give you an example. Um, uh, so at the Olympics, um, uh, the thing that I said as I dove into the water to myself, right? There's three seconds left. Schumacher's swimming in. He's at the hundred, and he's at, he's at the flags. Right. And then Australia and was it Australia and Australia Sweden and Sweden. Yeah. I yeah. watched the YouTube video. I'll probably play it here if I can without getting in trouble, but there's just neck and neck. Right. And so like the, it, it was obviously tight. I thought the Australians were way more equipped to, to beat us um, on paper. They should have beat us hands down. Um, they'd had a weird morning swim. And so I knew that they were somewhere close to us over there. I didn't know how, how close, um, at the, at the exchange, I was just focused on having a really good start, but the voice in my head that I talked to myself, the positive talk voice, right. Um, that was really the real voice. It wasn't the one convincing you that you were ready. It was the one like, okay, dude, here's, here's your ready. The voice said, um, all right, well, 17 years of your life came down to this. What do you got? Right? And <laughs> in a lot of ways, that could be a really scary thing to ask yourself. But for me, that was like the motivating thing. Like, hey, dude, like 17 years of your life, all the hay is in the barn, right? All the work has been done. Get out of your own way, 
right? Don't let anything else get in the way of showing what you're capable of. And so, um, you know, Eddie, Eddie, Eddie Sinnott taught me that. Um, hey is in the barn, fellas. Like that was a constant theme. Like no stress, don't worry about it. Just race, have fun, let it out. Don't let anything get in the way. And so um, th- repeated that, repeating that to myself was like a, a comforting thing and um, not, a, not an added stressor thing. So that's, that's kind of how I dealt with, with the negative, um, the voice that's always there. And there's always things happening to you, right? Like, I mean, six weeks before I left for trials, I was washing my car in the backyard and uh, there was like a, I don't know if you've ever seen like a, you know, uh, my mother-in-law had a whiskey barrel that she, you know, you plant things in and like, you know, the, me- the, the, the steel rib rim from about it. Well, that had come off the barrel and was in the driveway. I stepped on it and I felt it sharp. It's rusty. And so instead of like stepping any harder, cause I was already leaning into it, I just kneeled or I knelt down. And when I knelt, I knelt on the other side of the rim. So I opened up my knee, God, I don't know, six, eight, 10 stitches, something like that. Had to tie it together. I had to drive myself to the ER cause nobody was home at the time. And, uh, and I had to figure out how to swim for like seven to 10 days with stitches. Like, how am I, how am I going to do that? Like, no, you can't swim with stitches. You can't swim with stitches. So, you know, I figured that out eventually, you know, went through garbage bags with duct tape and all kinds of things. And of course I found, um, new skin was relatively new back then found that. And finally just, you know, after like four or five days, taped over it or, you know, painted over it and was good to go. Um, but what a weird thing to think you're going to take 10 days off of swimming six weeks in front of the Olympic games. So there were moments like that where you're, you kind of get a little tight as you're figuring out, okay, how am I going to navigate my way through this one? And I think that's probably the case for everybody, right? It's, it's a different story for everybody, whether you're, whether your neck hurts or whether your conditioning is bad or your conditioning won't be bad, but maybe you get sick or whatever. And like, how do you just like keep your head in the game and stick with the game plan and just kind of, um, you know, figure it out along the way. So I think those are, those are, it's natural to have barriers like that hop up in front of you. And it's important not to think uh, like, what was me? Or like, oh, why does this always happen to me? I mean, it always happens to everybody. Can't yeah. help but laugh about your story about <laughs> stepping on the whiskey barrel just because it's it reminds me of Jack. Oh, it's so kind of he gets himself yes. in the same situations. <laughs> He's out for a couple of days, but he always he always turns up and oh, kicks butt. Right. Every time every time I wonder why Jack always hurts himself in the stupidest ways. I yeah, should yeah, remember yeah. I should remember that the apple doesn't fall too exactly. far from the, the tree. Exactly. The apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. <laughs> right. So the haze in the barn. Mm-hmm. Seventeen years of seventeen years of your life. Mm-hmm. Let's see what you got. Yeah. What happened after you jumped in the water? Well, I think you have to rewind uh, to earlier that morning, right? And you have to ask yourself, and, and you have to say, well, Ryan, what was it like the first time you stepped, stepped on the deck as an Olympian? Right, because there's 10, 15,000 people watching. <sighs> yeah, I'm getting it's chills. bigger than any college meet, bigger than any Pan Am games. Yeah, I got chills thinking about that just now. And I think, you know... They, they, they had people, you know, the, the, the team and the managers and the coaches, they're like, listen, you need to go down on deck before, you know, before the pool closes. Make sure you just go down there like the day before, <sighs> take a deep breath and look up at the stands and realize what 15,000 people in the stands look like. And you're like, <laughs> I was dumb. I was like, I got it. It'll be fine. I've been to Pan American Games. I've been to World University Games. I've been to NSA Championships and Olympic trials. It's fine. So go down on deck and because I was the third fastest 200 freestyler and the first and second seeds, um, you know, John Piersma and, uh, and Josh Davis, they got to swim the 200 freestyle the day before. They had, back then, 200 free was the day before the 800 free relay. So it was easy. They posted their times, right? Prelims and finals. And then the four of us, three, four, five, six at trials got to post our times in the morning. And then they basically took the fastest four times in K- in, in the, and then in the unlikely event um, that there was another athlete swimming that day that wasn't on the relay they could insert, which um, in our case was Tom Dolan, massive, massive uh, stud distance swimmer, had a great 200 freestyle, but he was swimming the 400 I am that day. 
and it was like the last event before the 800 for relay. So we didn't know if they were going to put Tom on. And it was really depending on how well we swam and they would have to, to judge. So there were really seven people vying for four spots. So um, they said to me, well, you're, you're the third seed. You get to choose where do you want to swim this morning? And I decided that <clears throat> since their strategy was, all right, we're going to compare everybody's times based on their flat start. If there's, th there's three of you flat starting and there's three of you basically relay starting, um, that we're going to add a half second exactly to everybody's relay starts. So for me, that just added an extra element of something to think about that I didn't want because my job was the time trial right then, right? To have the fastest time that I could um, against the other six guys, which is weird that you're there competing against your teammates, right? But that's the truth is you, you just are in this situation. So I didn't want to have to worry about having an awesome relay start. Right? And I didn't want to have to worry about false starting either. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to lead off and we're, we'll deal with that. And then they can deal with their, with their starts and however they want to handle their starts. Um, and they're going to be told to have safe starts. But there's also an incentive not to have a safe start if they're adding a half second to your time. So anyways, that's a really long way of saying I chose to lead off. And um, so I go down on deck and they tell you, all right, listen, when they get to your lane, you need to make sure you, you know, walk to the lane, uh, to the starting block and turn and wave at the crowd. Okay, great. I got it. So they announce lane four, United States of America. And you walk over there and you turn and you wave. And at that second, all 15,000 people in the crowd did the same exact thing. They all took a picture without their iPhones, right? With the cameras that they brought with them. And I think so it's also <laughs> important to mention for anybody who doesn't know in 96, the games were at Atlanta, Georgia, yes. at home in the United States. At home in the United States. Oh. So fifteen. So there were 14,800 Americans in the stands, and they all wanted to see the United States of America swim. And that was when it hit me. Like, oh, my God. Right? At NCAAs, at all these other places we'd ever swum, they were looking – the people in the stands – really couldn't care less about me or lane four. They were really paying it. There were, there was eight different lanes that they could be paying attention to here. They were only carried they were only concerned about ours and all the, all the flashes and all that kind of came to a realization. And at that moment, my adrenaline rush hit and it was the hardest adrenaline rush I'd ever had in my life. Like I'm standing behind the blocks. I hadn't even gotten up on it. And I'm just trying to calm down, trying to take deep breaths, which probably hurt the adrenaline rush because now I'm maybe hyperventilating a little bit by getting a little bit too much oxygen in there. Um, and like suddenly I can't feel my face. And then I stand up on the blocks and my hands and forearms are pins and needles from my, from my fingertips down to my elbows. And I realize that I'm in this massive, massive rush. And I'm like, this is too early, right? I, I need to be having this later when I'm in the water. And so I go down and these, these blocks are really small and they're kind of slippery. I was wondering to get into that. And so I dive into the water and I'm just tight. And I did two things really, really badly. The first 50 meters of the race, I took like two breaths, the first 50 meters, which was horrible. And I kicked way too much because I was way too excited. And so by the last lap of the race, um, I'm like, I'm starting to die and I'm in oxygen deprivation and never in my life had I ever started to get tunnel vision. And I start to get tunnel vision as I'm, I'm like, oh my God, I, I might pass out. <laughs> and so I'm swimming and I, and I look over and this guy over in lane eight is going past me. I don't even know what country he's from, but he's going past me. I'm like, this can't be good. And I get my hand on the wall and I like, I don't pass out, but it's really close. And I'm like, oh my God, that was horrible. That I can't believe I just put that race together in Olympic games. Cause like I pride myself in being professional and keeping my stuff together. And I got completely thrown off my game by 15,000 people flashing their cameras at me. So fortunately for me, I don't think I was alone. And, um, also fortunately for me, the guy over in lane eight was, or seven, I don't even know what lane 
was from the Never- Netherlands. He was like a 17-year-old snot-nosed kid named Peter Van and Hogan Bands, which to you, uh, you know, uh, Olympic historians ended up, to, ended up being like just this amazing legend in the sport, 200 freestyler from the Netherlands, and had an amazing next uh, two Olympiads under his belt, kind of dueled out, dueled with Ian Thorpe uh, the rest of his career. And so I just got a dose of watching him go by me, which I would have gotten a lot of that if I had kept, kept swimming after that. So um, so as it turned out, I had the third fastest time of the six swimmers. And, um, you know, everybody's obviously looking and checking splits. Everybody knows where you stand. And so I felt pretty good I was going to make the team, but you just don't know, right? Like they could think – Somebody else looked better. They could put Tom Dolan on. And next thing you know, you're on the outside looking in. And so I'm a little nervous and tight. And I walk over literally across the street from the pool is uh, the cafeteria. And I walk in and they're sitting at the calf tables are like four of the coaches. And I look over and they're like, Ryan, come on over, have a seat. And I was like, oh my God, here it comes. And they said, um, so who do you think should swim on the relay tonight? And I was like, um, well, I think uh, Josh and Joey and me. And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. But like, who should swim fourth? And so I'm like, oh, are they just humoring me that like they say, yeah, 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 or what? But like, I was answering the question. And I knew they were there asking who was going to be fourth because Brad Schumacher had gone 149. 94 and John Piersma in the consolation final the night before had been 149.93. Okay. Hundredth of a second apart from each other. And they wanted to know who I would pick between the two, which seemed like a horrible question to ask somebody, right? You don't want to have to throw anybody else under the bus. And as an athlete, you always feel like you're proven by your times and everything else takes care of itself. But I could understand why they were asking the question. And I tried to demur, and they kind of made me, and they're like, oh. so me being sack and an opinionated guy, I felt like I should give him my opinion. And I just said, look, I, I said, I told him how my morning went and how unsettled I was that morning, and that um, I knew that I could swim faster that night. But um, actually, I told him that in a minute. Um, but I said that I thought Brad would be the right choice because – John had two opportunities to swim that fast. He had two opportunities. He had the, his first opportunity to be kind of scared out of his mind like I was, and then an opportunity to settle down that night and really put his best time forward. And he did drop, drop time from his morning to his night, but I, I felt like Brad was peaked and, and ready to swim faster at night just like I was. So I, I thought, I, I told Brad, actually I told him the story like uh, three months ago, and he's like, you never told me that story. I'm like, really? And he goes, yeah, thanks, man. Right? So um, so they said, okay, well, all right. So um, maybe Schumacher's on the team. Um, maybe maybe Piersma. But uh, like we think they would go, we think Joey and Brad would go like second and third. Um, where would you rather go, first or last? And I was like, oh. And I said, well, listen, coach, and, and they, they described what, how they thought that that night was going to go, right? And that Australia was, was on paper faster than us. The four guys that were on paper faster than us hadn't even swum in the morning. They had let like four other rando guys swim um, in the morning swim. And so like they had the opportunity to be massively faster. Now their, their four guys in the prelim swim had swum horribly and they had gotten seventh. So they were like going to be in lane one that night. And so it was going to be weird and that we knew they were going to be super fast, but they weren't going to be really close to you to, to, to see. And, and so kind of given that and given my history of loving to race and never finding a race that I, that I, you know, didn't love engaging in and, and didn't want, you know, never back down from one of those, um, you know, and that, not that being number one and number two, which is, was no less important is that Josh, had swum, he, he was built for leadoff, right? Like he was the kind of guy who would go out a second and a half faster than everybody else in the field and then like dare them to catch him. And so like he was trying to break them mentally in a, in a lot of ways. And he was also supremely confident that he could hold them off, even when he died like a 
like a, just a pig, right? He was horrible. He was dying, but he was still holding him off because he had amazing technique and he was an amazing specimen physically. And so the year before at the Pan Pax, he had swum the world's fastest time, not in his event, but leading off the 800 free relay. And I was like, coach, this is a no brainer. Like Josh should lead off and I will anchor. And I don't care if I go in a body length behind, you know, Michael Klim, who at the time was the fastest uh, Australian uh, 200 freestyler the Australians had. Um, but like, I don't care if I go in a body length behind him, I'll beat him. And I kind of looked him in the eye and I said it just like that. And, and I believed it. I wasn't like throwing anything out there. I believed it. Um, I was confident that I could race anybody in the world. And so uh, they're like, okay, well, we'll talk it over. We'll let you know. I was like, okay. And uh, unbeknownst to me afterwards, like they're all talking about it. And um, they were like, really? We should put Ruby on the relay and hanker? And Eddie Reese, the Texas great, um, who had recruited me and um, watched me swim against them the previous four years at conference and NCs, he's like, have you? have you guys been missing what he's been doing anchor and relays for SMU the last four years? Like that guy's going to do what he says he's going to do. No, no, that's right where he belongs. And, um, I didn't know that till much later, of course. Um, and so we go back that, you know, go back to the dorms, try and get some rest, not knowing what's going to happen. I probably slept an hour and we all get together in a team room just like this, uh, at the dorms before we, go over to the walk over to the pool, which was like a five minute walk. And we didn't walk. We took a tram. Um, and they were just like, okay, uh, um, you know, a hundred fly tonight. Uh, you know, Nicole Hazlett here, you know, Summer Sanders here and, and Nicole and Summer weren't on the teams. Um, I was just pulling out 92, but like here, here's what lane they're in in the final tonight. And everybody clapped after they said the, the, the name in the lane. And they got uh, men's they did a freestyle relay. Uh, you know, Davis, Hudapol, Schumacher, Peruby. And I was like, <laughs> I'm on it. Oh my God, I'm on it. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. Right. Yes. Not only am I on it, I'm anchoring. So it wasn't like I had a cell phone. I couldn't tell my parents. I couldn't tell my fiance. I couldn't tell my friends. You know, I mean, like you probably today in these days you have your phone and at least you tell everybody so they know what's going on. But like, think about your parent, my parents and Michelle. I mean, they're like in the stands. They're walk in that night. They've got no idea if I've even swimming, much less where I'm swimming. And so, <clears throat> so they like, they, they get in and, you know, and they're watching warm ups and like, oh, Ryan's swimming. Maybe he's on, maybe he's on the relay tonight. And that's like, that's the only like real idea that they had until maybe, maybe the heat sheet had my name, but I kind of doubt it. Actually, I think their clue was that they saw me warming up. So, um, so yeah, so that was like, that was it. So I'm on deck and, uh, I had warmed up. Actually, I, I was stretching on deck. We had gone over to the pool. I'm stretching on deck and Eddie sent it. Um, I see him walk in down at the far end of the pool. He's walking towards me. He doesn't know, right? He's the head coach for the Haitian Olympic team, okay? Because we had an athlete here that was dual citizen and ended up going to Olympics for Haiti and he got tapped as the head coach. So amazing that your your college coach is on deck. They're able to talk to you. They're able to kind of just calm you down. And uh, I see him run into Eddie Reese, and, you know, gets intercepted. So I know he knows and he comes down, he walks out and he's got tears in his eyes. <laughs> and he's like, they just told me, a Mustang is going to anchor the Olympic 800 freestyle relay for a gold medal. And I was like, geez, Ed. And he starts laughing and he's got tears in his eyes and he's laughing. And I'm like, all right. But he was supremely confident, you know, and he wanted to exude that confidence in me. And um, it was so important. Uh, it was so cool. What a gift to have him there and be able to kind of share that, um, you know, on deck. And Rody, of course, was in the stands, um, you know, and, uh, able to watch that. And that was amazing. And so, yeah, so, I mean, the 800 freestyle starts <clears throat> and we're in the ready room again, like this. Yeah, and just before that, do you remember what the last thing Eddie was that he said to you? I don't. Or any of your coaches, oh, what that last conversation oh, yeah, was? Yeah, yeah, 
yeah. So um, there was, yeah. So the funny thing is, is that everybody thinks, you know, um, that you have this great game plan, right? Um, before going into maybe the biggest event of your life or that maybe you warm up differently. But the truth is we all warm up the same way as we did from probably the time we were like 13 years old, right? My meat warm up was the same thing. I got it in, I swam a 500 and then I went, um, and then even though I was swimming freestyle and not I am, I would warm up uh, 200 of each stroke and I would go, uh, I would go like 50 swim, 50 drill, 50 kick, 50 swim, stop, and then one of each stroke. And then after that, I would do a little pace work and then I would get on the blocks and do a start or two and then that was it. So I would get in, I don't know, 15, 1800, something like that. So we all do the same things, just telling you. Nothing changes. Um, you go back to what you know, right? The drills that you know, the warm up that you know, that comfort and and what's worked for you in the past. So, uh, so I said, Ed. So, what do you think? Any last words of advice? Um, this had to have been right after that. And he goes, Yes. So the the, the, the sage words of advice were, um, don't t- don't kick very hard and breathe. Right. Like it's not it's not that hard. Just don't do what you did this morning. Right. And then he just said, he goes, and then, you know, just take it easy. That first hundred just, you know, you're going to be hot. You're going to be excited. Don't overkick it. Breathe a little bit. You know, take it easy. That first 50, you're going to be hot. Um, and then, you know, and then build a little bit that third 50 and then lower the hammer, the you know, the third 50, um, you know, after the second one and after that build and then bring it home. You'll be fine. I was like, okay, that's simple, right? Which is genius, right? Don't overcomplicate it. It's simple. You've done this before. Just the haze in the barn. Just open the door and let it all out. So, um, so we go into the ready room, and the ready room is full, right? Normally, it's, it's got eight people in it. Well, now it's got thirty-two guys in it, and they're all in this massive, like it's this massive mind game, which. You don't really anticipate until you're in there, but you're kind of in your zone. It doesn't really matter unless you're inclined to be in, you know, mess with. But I mean, think about Phelps and that, that just gorgeous, just video of that guy, you know, like trying to get in his head from behind him. And he's just like so intense and angry, you know, and I wasn't angry, but it was so funny having guys like swinging their hands, clapping in your face you know, headset on with a towel over their head, playing Metallica, blasting it, just staring at you. Just, it's just such a fun little mind game. And I'm giggling, right? And it's been raining all day. It's been this really interesting day in July, July 21st in Atlanta, in that it rained, not thunderstorms. There were some thunderstorms, but it literally rained all day. So there it is. And it's like, it probably doesn't crack 83 degrees in Atlanta in July, right? So weird. And you know, you're shaved, so you're cold. And, and me, I'm like this guy that I, I learned from, um, I've, I, I was a massive student of the sport, um, as we've talked about. And so I watched a guy named Mike Barrowman, who ended up being the world record holder in the 200 breaststroke. And I watched him walk out on deck in Miami, or I'm sorry, in Fort Lauderdale in 1991. I was 17 years old. I'd just gone on my national junior team trip. And I watched him walk out in August in Fort Lauderdale and he is wearing sweats, but he's wearing boots. He is wearing a turtleneck. He's wearing a ski hat and he's got gloves on. And I was like, what on earth? And I watched him and I watched him. He did this other thing too, right? He, when he got up on the blocks, he, they, you know, they blew the whistle. You're standing behind the blocks and he's doing this. Tapping his goggles. Got his goggles on one, two, double, whatever, back and forth. My, this this is where this is swerving all over the the road. If you want to straighten me out here, feel free. Okay, so like he taps right, and then he gets up on the blocks, and he's still tapping right, going back and forth. And they say, uh, gentlemen, two hundred meter breaststroke, take your mark. He's still standing, tapping. And then he stops and he slowly comes down. So what does the ref do? He goes, gentlemen, please stand. So everybody stands up, and what's the last thing he says? He says, lane four, please come down with the rest of the field. So what has Mike just done? He has controlled the entire field. He has made them get down and be ready to start, only to stand up. So maybe their adrenaline rush is already hitting them. 
He's already knows what he's doing. And the last thing that goes through their minds is, damn that Mike Barrowman. Right. Right? Like huge mental manipulation. Oh, he's so, so, such a genius, right? Such a genius. And so he jumps and he dives in. He goes 21060, sets the world record. And I was like, this guy's on to something. So the idea is to stay as warm as possible without sweating, right, Mike? Right? And so I talked to him a little bit about it. And yeah, he goes, if I if I start sweating, I take off a piece of clothing. I'm like, awesome. All right. So I started doing that from the time I was 17 on. Didn't matter where I was, how hot or cold it was. So here I am, I find myself back in Atlanta. What am I wearing? Right? Hiking boots, thermal socks, long underwear, uh, underneath my sweats, uh, a cat, you know, gloves and a ski hat. And I'm doing all the right things and I'm nervous, right? And I'm drinking water and, you know, and then you're, you're in there for a while. You're in there for like 20 minutes. Well, I end up, I'm drinking so much water, right? Um, it's pressure starting to build, but I'm ignoring it. And right about then, like the rain had kind of tapered off, but it had been gray and the sun starts to set. Cause it's like, it's like 8, 15 at night. On a, on, a, on a Sunday night, on the second night of the Olympics. So they had the opening ceremonies Friday, they had the first night of swimming on Saturday, second night of swimming is Sunday night. Everybody on the planet has just settled down after having dinner, or in the United States, not on the planet, but on, in, in the United States after having dinner, and they have the Olympics on, and this is the only thing that's on. And the sun comes out, and it's this amazing sunset. Color, pink, it's gorgeous. And I'm not usually bent to seeing, um, to seeing a higher power when I'm in the middle of focusing for this for for the for for my athletic endeavors. I'm really not. I, I more so now. I see I see that, but back then certainly not. And I like I nudge uh, Joe Hudipol next to me, and I said something like, "Man, check that out." I'm like, "God's here. God has made it an amazing evening," you know. I. We're here to we're here to improve upon it a little bit, and he was like, "I'm sure he was like, whatever, dude. Like, don't get me out of my zone, right?" And um, it was such a weird, out of character thing for me to like, not just notice and recognize, but then to say something to someone else. I just, I, someone else, I just couldn't resist. So, <clears throat> sorry. So, um, so we walk out on deck. And it's crazy and light flashes are going everywhere and, and excitement is high. And the only thing I can think about is, man, I got to pee. So <laughs> I've been drinking so much water and I'm like, how am I going to pull this off? Holy cow. I mean, I got to go. There's no way I'm going to go six, seven more minutes and not pop. And so uh, I'm, that's all I'm doing is like sitting there strategizing. My mind's kind of like, Ugh! And so I developed this plan, and the plan is that after we walk and we wave at the crowd, which we do wave, fine, handle the crowd, no problem. Um, maybe because I'm so focused on handling this other problem, um, that the second they blow the whistle and Josh gets up on the blocks, I shuck my, my pants and sit on the end of the diving wall that's just behind the blocks and warm it up. Right. So, uh, that was the plan. Cause I'm like, where's everybody going to be looking? They're not gonna be looking at me. They're gonna be looking at Josh. Right. Like even my parents probably not even looking at me and it worked like my parents, my fiance, nobody noticed when I went back afterwards. I'm like, did you guys see that? And they're like, no, I wasn't even looking at you. I'm like, perfect. <laughs> right. So, um, so with that problem taken care of, uh, Josh swims like amazing right he's got like three quarters of a body length on the field on the field uh after his leg and the plan's going perfectly joe huda pulled so he goes one what did he go he went uh like 148 one i think lead off um and so and so uh joey jumps in and joey's swimming great joey's like this legend he he uh made the olympic team at 18 years old went to Barcelona, um, and for the first time in a long time, uh, I'm not even sure they placed uh, at the Olympics in 92. It was like this really weird upset. The Russians won it. They set a world record. It was crazy. Um, and, like, the Americans didn't medal. First time the Americans hadn't won gold in, like, like 
probably seven or eight Olympiads, right? So he had been part of that. And I think a big part of him was trying to make sure he kind of righted, uh, rectified that situation, if you will. Well, Joey swam a great race, right? Like he only swam, he, he swam the slowest leg. Uh, Josh swam the fastest leg. Um, and there was only a second in between, right? Uh, from the fastest to the slowest. Me and Schumacher were in between. And, but the problem was for Joey that the rest of the world's fastest guys went second. So Anders Holmerts jumps in for Sweden. He has gone in dead last if you look at the race. He's, he's in lane five. He hits the wall dead last. You don't even see him jump in because he's so far behind in the, in the, uh, in the shot. He swims like the fastest first hundred meters of anybody in the race. And he is second place by the time he hits the hundred. This is a guy who has gotten third in three consecutive Olympic games, bronze medal, right? In 96, 92, and 88. It's amazing, amazing, amazing. So um, so Joey gets caught, right? And he touches the wall like third or fourth. Now, Joey didn't have a bad swim. Joey just, that was just how, how the ball bounced for him. Um, he had a great swim. And so then Schumacher jumps in the water. And who's swimming next to him for Sweden but Lars Frölander? And if you turn around, you can find Lars Frölander on, on the wall back here under 2000 in Sydney. Four years later, Lars went on to win an Olympic gold medal in the Hunter Butterfly. Okay. Um, I knew how good he was. I was. If I was worried about anybody in the whole pool, it might have been the Australians, but more than likely, it was Lars's ability to just pop something off. And so... Lars and Brad go in the water. They swim neck and neck the whole way. Uh, Lars pulls out in front. Brad catches him, and Brad actually outtouches him by probably, I don't know, a foot and a half. Okay. So uh, I'm nervous, right? But whew, focused. All right, 17 years of your life. What do you got? Um, in the back of my mind, I know the Australians are out there, and I know they're hunting for us. That's all I know. I don't know if they're in front of me. I don't know if they're behind me. I just know that they're going to be in the game. So I dive in the water, rip my start, kick it out. And if you watch Anders Liebring, um, who was an 18-year-old kid from Sweden, he's, been, he's the poor guy, the least experienced guy. They were like, look, we're going to put him out there. And whatever he does, he's going to get on adrenaline, I, I, I think, is, is what the strategy was, given the experience in the, of, of the, guys, the guys on Sweden's team. So I like instantly on my start. Um, you know, get a nice little half body length lead, um, which is pretty cool. Um, and my strategy in the race was I breathed a little bit better to my right than to my left. So I breathed four, two, uh, was my cycle. And I just made sure to stick with that from the very first go, um, instead of, you know, hold my breath the first 50 got real relaxed. Um, so just worked my turns and staying relaxed that first 50, 75 and started to build into it. I turned it the hundred um, and I had a body length, I think, on the Swede, and I checked on him. So I, I got, came about 20 yards off the wall. I'm breathing to my right towards lane one, but I'm not really looking. I'm just focusing on my thing. And I look to my left, and I see the honors starting to fall back, honors Liebring from Sweden. And so I thought, all right, I got 75 meters left to go. I haven't seen the Australians. When I've looked easily, I need to start looking. So I take my breath over. I don't see anybody. Okay. Next breath over, I look in front of me. I don't see anybody up there either. Next breath, I look in back of me. And way back there, probably five, six, seven yards back, I see a splash in lane one. And now I'm 10 meters off the wall. I got 60 meters left in my race. And I'm like, I'm out here all by myself. Oh my God. Okay, rip this turn and just bring it home. And at this point, like there's no pain in the race. There's no suffering in the race. There's no struggle. I don't remember any of that. Okay. All I remember is like what I spent the previous three and a half months visualizing, right? How I felt, how the water felt, how the bubble sounded by the cap, um, the taste of the water, right? How, what the temperature was like, how, how where I was going to be relative to everybody else. And obviously it didn't work out exactly that way, but I was so prepared. I felt like my mind was ready for whatever came um, for whatever my body could produce. And so I ripped the wall 
and came off and the crowd leaps to its feet and starts to roar and I can hear them. The first time in my life, I've heard a crowd yell and known it was just for me, right? Just for us. And that was incredible to swim the last 45 meters of the race, hearing a crowd. And, you know, with 20 meters left in the race, I'm looking right, there ain't nobody. I'm looking left, there ain't nobody. And knowing you're going to win an Olympic gold medal 20 meters before the end of your race, like that's never happened to me, you know, being up like that in any race, quite frankly, uh, of, of massive import. And so, um, you know, touching the wall and checking again and everybody's smacking your head. And I mean, what an amazing, amazing feeling and jumping out. And like, you know, I, it was a funny thing, like, um, uh, the pictures that got taken that for, for all of, you know, they got disseminated by the AP and by Getty was me with my arms up. Uh, one of two photos. One was like me in the water and the guy standing over the, the end of the lane and me with my hand in the air. Um, and I had my tongue out, right? And, and probably 75% of the photos, they edited that out. You see some pictures and my tongue is in the photo and some it's gone. It's, it's the most amazing group of photos back before Photoshopping. They managed to do that. Um, but I mean, it was amazing. And so like the cool thing is, and the crazy thing is, is that there was like seven minutes from the time that I touched the wall to the time that they opened the door and walked out for your medal ceremony. Right. That's a lot of time for that to just. You think that's a lot of time. I was like, slow it down, baby. Right? Like, oh my God, slow it down. Because I'd spent my whole life thinking about what that race, not my whole life, but certainly the last three and a half months, thinking about what that race was going to be like and having it be perfect and executing everything the way I wanted to execute it. You didn't dare jinx yourself to think about what it was going to be like after you hit the wall. So it's like, it's almost like you were just it's it's too much to say you were just born, but it's like you just woke up and you're like, oh my God, that just happened. Now what? You know, like, oh my God, oh my God. And you, and you just, and so, and so it's all about like wanting it to slow down and to soak it in and to, and to remember every last bit of it. And, and, and that was the really neat part. And so you're just, it was, it was fun. So you go into the building after waving at the crowd, they basically give you a new pair of sweats, not the, not the sweats you walked out with, but the metal sweats from champion. And then they open the doors at the other end of the stadium and out you walk up onto the stands. And so, uh, that was incredible. Um, you know, walking out there and the whole place gets real quiet. So before you guys head out there, what what was the first thing that you said to your teammates when you got out of the pool? Oh, I don't remember, man. I don't remember. I just remember embracing everybody. I remember um, just, just how relieved we were, you know? I mean, a lot of these guys, this was not um, – the other guys, this was not their last race, right? Both Joey and Josh and Brad had the 400 free relay um, – I don't know if they had individual events. I don't think so. All three guys had the 400 freestyle relay to swim still. Um, so they couldn't, they were relieved. It was like breaking the ice for them. For me, it was like, baby, I'm done. This is amazing. Like I can, I can spike the football, right? Um, they had to little, be a little bit more reserved. Um, so I don't remember that. It was just so much excitement and just, uh, congratulating everybody, telling them what a great job they'd done, recounting the amazing, you know, their swim to them and what it was like and what the, what the crowd had been like. And, um, I don't know, just, it was a pretty cool feeling doing that together as a group. Um, even though, you know, I, I think it was way more meaningful to do that for me at the NCAAs with a group of guys that I'd spent years and years training with. Um, it wasn't exactly the same as doing it as with an Olympic team. I love all those guys and I still keep up with all those guys. I mean, uh, Josh Davis was in our wedding, was a groomsman in our wedding. Um, Brad Schumacher, we saw, uh, in the last six months and gave, uh, you know, my son great advice on water polo and swimming. Um, and Joe Hudapol manages money, um, you know, in gosh, where is he? Uh, I think he's in Atlanta, um, now and, um, we did it for Goldman Sachs for a while, but we still stay in touch. So, I mean, like I'm still tight with those guys, but not quite as tight as those guys that I swam with at SMU. Um, so anyways, the door opens and out we walk and, um, you know, I mean, I don't know. What do you say about that? Uh, you know, the girl comes over, 
She gives you the flowers that you bend down. They put the metal over your neck. You stand up. A lot of a lot of satisfied, probably you know, deep breaths. You know, and was standing um, on that podium part of something that you visualized? Never. No. 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 That was way too far. So if you were to go back in time when you were still setting those goal times and mm. setting your goals at the beginning of the college season, and if somebody would have told you that you're going to win a gold medal, what would have gone through your head? Uh, don't get ahead of yourself. I got to make trials first. You know, it was always like. Uh, I never wanted to be too overwhelmed with a goal that was too big, you know, like right, just always like, something that you could bite on. Yeah. Compartmentalizing things. Right. And, and baby steps. And I think that's why Phelps was so good at doing what he did is his ability to compartmentalize and be like, all right, for the next 15 minutes, I'm just going to focus on warming up or cooling down or eating this granola bar or laying down and getting horizontal before my next event, like not thinking about anything else. This is what I'm doing right now. And you read more and more about people do that do amazing things, you know, uh, uber long distance running or, or double triath, you know, double Ironman or Navy SEALs. And they get in the same thing, right? Like, okay, like it hurts, but um, I'm not going to get overwhelmed with the size of the mission or the size of the race. I'm just, this is what I'm doing for the next little bit. And that's all I'm going to focus on. And it's um, a really powerful a uh, tool for your toolkit, not to let anything get to be too big to the point that you're overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you come into being on the podium at the Olympic Games with a gold medal. So how do you deal with that? Because there's no way it can't be overwhelming. No, there's no way that it can't be overwhelming. Maybe unless you're Phelps and you're getting your eighth medal. Right. But at that right. point, the eighth medal, <laughs> seventh medal. I'm sure he like was that. overwhelmed too, yeah. but he was just worried about the next event. Really, you know, at that point, I'm sure he was already compartmentalizing, yeah. knowing knowing Michael, right, and not enjoying the moment for what it was worth. He probably didn't do that, in the, you know, until the end, um, when he saw the end in sight and had a little bit more maturity. Um, but like, you know, that was. Yeah, so you're standing up there, and honestly, like, there was definitely some retrospection about, you know, how you got there and who got you there. I mean, my Coach Kavanaugh from North Palm Beach Country Club, who helped me become who I was, was in the crowd, standing next to my parents. I had 18 people that I knew that had gotten tickets or I had gotten tickets for that were in the crowd that night. And if I had been in any other country in the world, in any other Olympics in the world, that wouldn't have been impossible. And um, so what an amazing thing, you know, I get I get through and <sighs> it, was, it was a weird memory, but you're standing on the, on the podium. They say, ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the anthem of the United States of America. Everybody stands up. And then the two seconds before the anthem starts to play, Somebody yells out from like, you know, the 48th row away in the back, you know, way to go, USA. And like, you can't cheer, right? Nobody can cheer. But like, it was such a cool thing to have that just little, that little moment where yeah. just a little extra excitement. <clears throat> and, um, and so they play the national anthem. And uh, so, and then we get down and they basically you go on this walk down the stands because in Atlanta, all the stands were on one side. I'm, I'm sorry, all the spectator stands were on one side of the pool, and the other side of the pool was like media um, and you know officials, and then all the athletes were on the other. So it was easy to keep them apart that way from a security standpoint. And so, uh, so you walk down the spectator side, and I saw my my future wife, my fiance Michelle, on the stands, and got to wave at her, and she blew me a kiss, and. Um, I think she's the only one I saw in the stands. Um, but, uh, so, so scrolling back. So we won Sweden gets second, right. And Germany just out touches Australia for the bronze. And so, um, so the guy from Germany, um, one of the guys from Germany throws up a, a bouquet into the stands to somebody that he knew. And, uh, he took it up, back it up into the stands and he found my grandmother, Agnes Kirchis Donahue, who was born, you know, like two years after her family came to the United States in 1923. She had never seen me swim before. She lived in Connecticut, 
never seen me swim. And she and my grandfather, Tom, uh, drove down from Connecticut, probably took him two days and they were there to watch that event. As you can imagine, by the end of that race, like everybody within a 15 yard radius knew exactly whose kid, whose grandson was, you know, anchoring that relay. And so this must've been one of those guys. And he took that bouquet of flowers and he weaved his way back up into 40 rows of stands at the, the last event of the night when he could have been leaving. And he found my grandmother and he gave her those flowers and that bouquet. And he said something about, you know, from my country to yours, congratulations. And um, she had that bouquet of flowers on the wall for the rest of her life. And that was a really massive moment, not just for her, but for me, and really indicative of the Olympic movement and the selflessness and, um, you know, the idea of peace through sport that, rep that that is the Olympics. So that was a pretty cool event. And then, um, so I don't know, you, I'm, you want me to keep going on this? You know, I'm, I can just keep telling a story and a narrative, but what do you want? I'm captivated. <laughs> okay. Keep on going. So, um, so I'm just trying to keep in mind uh, who else might be listening. So, um, so I, I don't know. I think that the, the funny thing is, is that, so I wanted to go out and find my, uh, my family. And so I had told, um, so in the stands, I think I told Michelle, I had, but there were no plans, right? And there's no cell phones. And so I saw her, I'm like, wait here not knowing that security was going to clear the crowd, right? So um, so I come out and I look after drug testing and media and everything, and ain't nobody in the stands. And so Josh Davis, who was married at the time, he got married young. He was a couple years older than me. He's like, uh, or maybe he was even, I don't even know he's married. But his wife, Chantel, uh, we'll say his wife, Chantel, he's like, yeah, I told her the same thing. I'm like, where do you want to go? He's like, well, let's go up the road here to the Speedo Village. So we like walk out through security and walk up like a quarter mile up this hill. And Speedo had a little village, just a little kind of hospitality area, if nothing else. And they were lovely about welcoming all the family and friends to um, from probably all Olympians, but definitely from their Speedo athletes in um, for refreshments and have a place to get out of the heat. And so we were right. And that's. Um, kind of everybody had had gone uh, there. And so they saw us from a long way away. And so they all start screaming and running. And it was like, you know, chariots of fire at the end. You know, you just kind of running at each other and embracing, which is really, really cool. And so um, they were like, all right, well, where do you want to go? I'm like, well, it's Sunday night at 10 o'clock in Atlanta. I don't know. I'm like, all right, we'll figure something out. So we go and we get on uh, MARTA. And... Um, <laughs> And my mother-in-law, we're like, we're like packed in there like this, right? And uh, my mother-in-law at some point goes, uh, Ryan, this is Ryan Baruby. He just won an Olympic gold medal. And like all 200 people on the train were like, oh my God. And they all want an autograph. They all want to take their picture with you. And that was like, is so, so crazy. And so we get off like the last stop on Marta. We rode like, you know, who knows, 15 miles. And we get off the only place open at 11 o'clock at night in Atlanta. Trust me. Uh, on a Sunday um, was Denny's. So that's where we had our victory uh, dinner. And um, it was awesome. And there was some stuff up on the on the television. My buddy, my best friend from high school was there. And uh, he had driven in with uh, Michelle, my fiance, and her sister, Ariana, and her mom, um, Lana, from Dallas. They had driven in the day before, stayed with friends, Suzanne Douthat, um, and then watched me swim. And then they all had to get back to work. So they literally dropped me off at the village at two o'clock in the morning and start driving back to Dallas. So I'm like, go through security and all the, all the guys are so awesome because none of the guys in security at 2 a.m. had seen anybody go through with a, with a medal. So I made sure they got to see it and took pictures of them with it and all that stuff. And so I got back to the dorms at like 2.30. We're supposed to meet at 6 a.m. to be on um, Good Morning America on ABC. And so... Uh, I can barely sleep. Obviously, I think I slept with it. I don't know, if I, I don't know, know where it was. I think I was in in the box in bed with me, but I don't think I don't think it got any further than that. Um, and so we get up at six o'clock in the morning, and uh, we head over to this little media place, right? So we go to good, good Morning America, or all the media places, all the media stations had a place for you to meet, and they would come pick you up, and then take you wherever they needed to do to to have their interview. Well, Good Morning America forgot. 
that they told us to show up. So we're there at like 6, and then we're there at 6.30, and then we're there at 7.30. We're like, I don't know. This is ridiculous. What do you think we should do? Again, it's pre-cell phone. What do you do? Like four guys, you're exhausted, but excited. And so the uh, the NBC guy from today, of course, being the Olympic Network, they've got a place on site on the village. Everybody else is going to come pick you up and take you to wherever their site is. They're like, hey, you guys want to come on with us? We're like, I mean, we've been here an hour and a half. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so we like go in and we go into the green room and who's in the green room, but magic Johnson. And he's like, Oh my God, fellas, you were amazing. That was incredible. Last night I watched it. Like, can I take my picture with you? And you're like, yeah, that'd be great. Right? <laughs> so we get a picture with magic Johnson. Who's fired up and we walk out and we, you know, we had a really cool, like five or six minute interview with, um, Bryant Gumble and Katie Couric. And that was really cool. You know, it was so fun. And then, you know, and so that was that was like uh, the beginning of the craziness. But, um, you know, since then, you know, met a couple of presidents. There were two there at the games. Bill Clinton was there. Um, I think his daughter had a crush on a swimmer. And so she was there every night. And Jimmy Carter, obviously being from Atlanta, uh, being from Georgia, was there uh, to help celebrate. And um, anyways, just amazing, amazing kind of just you know, roller coaster ride from then on. But, you know, at, at the end of the day, really, I mean, I tell you all this stuff, but at the end of the day, I was still, you know, the day before the swim or the day before the trials, I was still the guy that like woke up in the morning, tired as a dog, just like all you guys do and get in the water and hated it. You know, I hated just that moment of getting in the water and being cold, but relished the practice, um, got out, Went to school, stank like chlorine, fell asleep in second period, you know, um, and was kind of that weirdo, right? That was kind of not like everybody else in school um, because I kind of had my eyes on bigger things, I think. So, you know, nothing really changed. I'm lucky enough to, you know, have an Olympic gold medal, which I forgot to bring with me today. I'm sorry. Um, but It's uh, fine. Josh Davis showed me his. I have a picture with it. When I was 12, he swung out to Illinois and he brought him over. He did a stroke right? clinic with our club team. Yeah. He does a good stroke clinic. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> Couldn't remember much of it. It was the very beginning of my, my swimming career, but still have that picture. It's upstairs. That's awesome. In my bedroom. I remember he had uh, a meet because he's coaching in Oklahoma now at Christian mm -hmm. University, yeah, I want to yeah, say. That's right. So he's out here at SMU uh, a couple months ago and I walk over to whoever was in the next lane. I go, no, it was Steve. I asked Steve Collins. I said, is that coach related to Josh Davis? And Steve goes, that is Josh Davis. <laughs> I go, no way. So I text my mom. I was like, hey, can you go in my bedroom upstairs in the drawer? You know, all the way on the left, third shelf, there's a picture I had when I was on Palatine Park District with Josh Davis at the stroke clinic. So she goes, awesome. she takes me the picture. Yeah. I, Did you show I it to him? You too. No, I didn't get a chance since I was busy timing and then I couldn't find him after the meet. Oh, that's awesome. Sooner or later. That's really cool. Well, he'll be back. Yeah. And if you're still here, I'll make sure uh, if you're there, I'll make sure we'll, we'll put that connection together. That's so cool. Well, you know, I mean, that, that is really the, the amazing beauty of being an Olympic athlete is that like for the rest of your life, you have this cool platform and what you decide to do with it, um, I think is an interesting commentary on like who you are as a human being. Yeah. And, and I mean, you've done great things with it, with, Swim across America. Yeah. You well, want to talk a little bit about how you got into that and Yeah. Well, I I think I think in general, I think talking about that platform, you know, you can choose to do a lot of things with it. And for me, I think the basis of um of what I chose to do with that platform was always grounded in the philosophy that I only got to where I was because I've of other people who are willing to give me a part of them, right? and allow me to stand on their shoulders and to do everything that they could in order for me to be the best version of me. And they saw something in me and gave me something, right? Whether it was encouragement, mental fortitude, the, you know, the, the message to have grace um, with myself when I disappointed myself, whatever it was, right? Um, on and above the coaching. And so um, I think that for me, using that platform to encourage encourage those messages and encourage people to um, to be the best versions of themselves and to help them do that and to see that 
they have the ability to control their their futures um, in ways that they probably don't think that they do. And those are messages that I have for for most importantly for like eight, nine, ten year olds. You know, by the time you're 16, 17, you may have a bit of self confidence. But when you're like eight, nine, ten, like a lot of times you think, well, I'm just going to go where my mom and dad want me to go. Right? I'm going to do, all right, that's what they said I'm going to do. That's what I'm doing. But, you know, the truth is, is that you're eight and you're nine and you can make decisions in 10 that, um, that directly affect and impact you and, and, and your future. And it's weird to think about being 10, but. I think another super important thing is just if you have awareness at that age too, kind of like you said, where you became a student of the sport, just as an example, but it could go to any walk of life. If you're eight, nine, and 10, and you just have an awareness of what's happening to you and that you do have control, there's a lot to learn rather than just going where you're told and doing what you're told. Yeah, absolutely. And, and having the confidence to do that because yeah. um, it's hard to, to gain that sometimes. So, um, uh, you know, I think on the, on the form of giving back, um, the most recent thing I've been involved with um, – or one of the more recent things has been Swim Across America. And I got involved with them. Um, uh, Swim Across America being this amazing organization that raises money um, to uh, fund cancer research and uses, uh, at least initially, utilizes Olympians and their um, ability to bring people into the fold um, to, to kind of kick off swims um, in whatever city and state they might be in across the country. And so that's kind of how I got involved early on is being asked to be involved um, initially in a San Francisco in the San Francisco swim um, under the Golden Gate. And then at the very first year that they had these, uh, it'll be, gosh, 12 years ago. Um, and so I was involved with that and enjoyed raising money. And I and, 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 the, and the connection there um, towards cancer research is my wife, Michelle, had a brain tumor removed when she was, uh, she was diagnosed, I think, at 17 maybe uh, 16, 17, and had it removed when she was 20. At the time, we were dating, um, so um, I was lucky enough to be able to be there uh, to kind of support her in that process. Um, and so, you know, it's definitely a, um, it was, a, you know, it was successful and uh, we're so blessed as a result. And so um, it, it really spoke to me. Um, about giving people the hope and the fortitude um, and the ability to to look at things and think that um, you know they can still control their destiny. So, um, funding cancer research was made a lot of sense. So, um, so yeah. So I've been involved with that. Um, you know, just as a fundraising function for probably the first five years, and then uh, for the last seven um, on a more proactive role and um, being a director for the local swim, uh, co-director of the local swim. Um, for the first five years, I was more of the guy who like uh, kissed babies and shook hands. Um, and I had an amazing partner who did uh, the vast majority of the really hard work. Um, and then the last two years, um, uh, I've, uh, you know, I've tasked, um, my great friend, Mike Smith, uh, and college roommates and, uh, groomsmen in my wedding, um, to, uh, to, to help me with that. So the two of us have been kind of doing that together the last couple of years and having a great time and doing it successfully. So it's been great. Yeah. So as far as I've seen, it's been an awesome organization because we swam it together just, uh, over the summer. Yeah, it was fun. It was your first, it was your first time. Yeah. Uh, it was hot. But it was great. It was Community nice. was good. Yeah, yeah. It'll be raised good money. We raised good money. You know, it's fun. You know, it's amazing that in a day you can put you know a quarter of a million dollars towards a cause, and uh, it shows you what um, you know how much people want to make a difference in their communities. So it's it's a ton of fun. It's and it's always different, and it's uh, it's a great way to give back. Yeah. One of the one of the many ways. But on the topic of giving back, let's bring it a little closer to home. Mm. So your son Jack is. Uh, going off to university. Congratulations, mm -hmm. by the way, because he just committed to University of Virginia. Yes. Um, Very excited. So I guess for anybody listening, the 101 is that Jack grew up playing water polo his entire life and just this year decided that he wanted to swim and has a natural talent for it. And he also works really, really hard. He started swimming some meets, has put down some really fast times, competed at junior nationals, got recruited, it's on to quick. home at Virginia, right? <laughs> so what kind of role do you play both as a father and kind of a mentor? 
because obviously Ooh. you've been through it all from every single angle. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. Um, you know, I, my dad didn't didn't like stick his nose in everywhere. Uh, my parents didn't stick his, stick their noses in everywhere in my development. Um, and maybe sometimes for the better and sometimes maybe not for the better, just for, uh, you know, from a support standpoint. And so I'm trying to balance, like trying to figure out when you want him to figure things out on his own and when you want to maybe drop a, a little you know, a question here and there to see, to make sure he's answering all the right questions um, or, you know, having all the right answers to all the right questions. So, um, you know, it's been hard, I think, um, for me in that, you know, we encouraged water polo because it kept him close to the sport of swimming, um, which I knew that he could love, but he just didn't really love it when he was 10 and 11. Um, so we encouraged him actively to get out of it. And so he just played water, he played water polo from, you know, what, 13 to 18. Um, and so, it was great because I could just be a daddy and uh, I didn't know anything about water polo and I couldn't say anything to him about anything. So there was never any worry about am I being imposing um, upon him um, by being a swim parent. I just got to sit back and enjoy the awesomeness that is being a water polo uh, swim parent um, and uh, and cheerleader. So that was really great. And um, you know, he would, he started swimming, you know, he started swimming in high school, just, just on the high school, um, uh, team and didn't really swim much on the team. Well, he didn't swim any on the team, um, to speak of, and, but, you know, a couple of weeks before, um, you know, his state meet, he and I would come to the pool and just spend, I don't know, probably five or six practices of 45 minutes or an hour just doing starts and turns, no technique work. I didn't want to get in his head and mess with anything two weeks or three weeks before he, he competed, but just controlling the little things that he could control that had nothing to do with talent or skill or feel and everything just about executing little things. And, you know, the truth is, is that not everybody takes input like that so close to their event um, or a big event, you know, they're kind of fixed in their way and they, and they're accustomed to the way they do things. And when you try and tweak things, you know, for some people, that's very, very difficult to absorb. And um, I think luckily he's been always open to that and adjusting on the fly. And he listens. He's very, very coachable. So we were able to really do some neat things on starts and turns that helped him and gave him some advantage, I think, especially when he was yeah, you know, I mean, he's not training. He's just going in swimming races other than what he's doing in water polo. So, I mean, um, so for me, I think from a mentorship standpoint, I think it's just been about trying to help him navigate, um, you know, the ups and downs of, uh, of sport and the disappointments and the excitement and making sure that you never get too high and you never get too low. Um, and, you know, he has a, he has a tendency, I think much like I do to be hard on himself. And, um, you know, learning grace uh, when you've disappointed yourself, and you heard me say that earlier, is such an important thing. And so that I think, you know, giving him the basic foundational tools on which he can build himself um, when he's not around us anymore, I think that's the most important thing as a parent. What do you think are some of the things he does really well on the soft side? Like you said, managing the sport, managing emotions. Yeah, I think, I think... Up until now, it'll be interesting to see if this changes now that he is firmly committed to be a swimmer. But up until now, every time he's been at a big swim meet, he's been just, there's been zero pressure, zero expectations. He's like, ah, I'm a water polo player. What do I have to lose? So he just gets up there and he's super loose and he's dancing and he's got his earphones going and he's doing a little of this and he's doing a little bit of that. And everybody around him at the swim meet is losing their noggin because they're like, why isn't he uptight like me? I'm super nervous. This is the biggest meet of my life so far. And this kid, who is he? I've never even seen him at any of these swim meets. And he's like dancing like they're really thrown off their game. And so that's been a huge competitive advantage. And I want to make sure that he, you know, that he understands that. I think that's the biggest challenge. I think he does. He just, you know, it's nice to remind him, hey, be loose, have fun. Hay is in the barn. Like, 
control what you can control. And that is not letting your head get in the way of a great performance. Right. And, um, and then just do all the things that you've been learning the last couple of months or years and just let the head out of the barn. So I don't know if that really answered your question. <laughs> no, I think it covers it pretty well. <laughs> It'd be interesting to see what he does at college too, when he does have a total different environment. Yeah, I think he's going to love the supportive swim team environment. Uh, he's really loved the club environment that way. And I think much like me, I mean, having having 25 guys and 25 girls on campus that are your people. Oh, yeah. I think he's going to uh, feed off of it. Because I remember the very first day he came into practice. And it was the same thing. I didn't know who he was besides that, you know, you guys have a lot of resemblances. So I kind of put two and two together, <laughs> but he walked into practice and he was, you know, yelling at Enrico from across the deck, super <laughs> confident as if he was in his own backyard. And then we started racing. I think it was fifties and mm-hmm. I was still getting warmed up. I don't know if I was tired or whatever, but he turns over to me. He's like, come on, man. I thought you were faster than that. <laughs> the first thing, first thing he's ever said to me. He's like, like 17 years yeah, old. Like, who's this 17-year-old kid who's hiking me on at practice? And he's a water polo player? <laughs> so just just to see that kind of friendly competition mm-hmm. and then multiply it by 20-plus other guys he's going to have on the college team, and they're all feeding off of each other, and there's camaraderie. Yeah. I think he's going to thrive. I think he's going to do great. I yeah. think he's going to thrive. I think the biggest battle, as it is with everybody when they go to college, is adapting to the new training regimen, adra- adapting to – life more or less on your own. Um, and then maybe most importantly for him is just like, you know, keeping yourself doing the things necessary from a physical standpoint to make sure you don't get injured and that you're prepared to be your best every day. And, you know, those are things that you just, that all of us learn as we go through the college experience. Some of us learn them better than others. And I have no, no doubt that he'll learn them and learn them well. Um, but you know, I mean, those swimmers, they're always klutzes, me included, right? <laughs> I mean, how many, how many stories have I told you about that? So in the back of your mind as a daddy, that's what you're always worried about is, uh, is he going to trip over something? Is he going to put something down on his foot? You know, whatever. But that's that's life. Absolutely. So do you have any advice for some younger swimmers, uh, maybe not on the college level yet, but age group who are looking towards high schools, competing in j- JOs, junior nationals? <sighs> I got all kinds of advice. What do they want to hear? No, and 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 funny is what what haven't they heard? Um, I, I think my advice is this: number one, believe in yourself, and believing that you can control your destiny. Um, you can control your future. It may not turn out exactly the way maybe you have in all of your goal sessions in your minds, but you can control a massive part of how your future ends up in this sport and in life and know that and believe it because it's true. And then I would say, and it's kind of a theme here, isn't it? Is that um, trust your coaches and be a curious athlete and be a student of the sport and know that there's always something to learn and that there's always somebody out there that's going to be better than you are. And the difference between whether you're going to touch the wall first or whether they're going to touch the wall first many times doesn't come down to the amount of talent that they have or the amount of training that they have. What comes down to is how mentally prepared you are, how much have you been paying attention to the details. Look at me, I'm a 5'11 kid in a, in a world of 6'4 or 6'6 guys. Um, so a lot of times it's about your preparation. And so do all the little things right. Focus on the little things and the things that you can control and don't worry about the rest that you can't control. So last bit to wrap it up, I want you to step in my shoes. So if you're sitting on this side of the table, is there any question or any topic you would bring up that I haven't? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's a couple of things, um, you know, what, what, um, what role do parents play and maybe what role should parents play in this child's development? And maybe this is not the group necessarily that's supposed to be listening to this. Um, but maybe this is the point where you kids can take this clip and show it to your mom and dad if you feel like this might resonate with them. Um, but you know, I've seen a lot of good 
parents and I've seen a lot of good coaches and I've seen a lot of bad parents and a lot of bad coaches. And I think what, um, what the good parents have in common is that they understand their children and their motivations and their desires, and they learn how to not push them too hard. Because your athlete is only going to be as great as your athlete wants to be. You can't make your athlete great as you want them to be. They have to want that. And um, you as an athlete, you all can be great at something in this world. I truly believe that. It may not be swimming. It might be playing the piano. It might be division, right? But like you can be really, really, really good at something if you like put your mind to it um, and you're passionate about it and you have fun doing it, right? And I think that's maybe something we didn't, we didn't uh, touch on a lot here was, was the power of having fun. Um, and, and we can, but I think having fun is a massive, massive part of why I stayed involved in the sport. Um, why I think the, the kids that do stay in it stay during those really tough times, right? Like when you start doing doubles or when you plateau, right? Like you have to be having fun doing what you do and you have to figure out a way to have fun through the grind, Absolutely. Yeah. Cause the stories are great and the motivation is great, but behind the scenes of all of it, there's a lot of grit and blood, sweat and tears, which is life really. But in order to get through that, you need to have that fun. You need to have the goals and the right attitude. And I think what you said is hitting the nail on the head that as a young kid or as a parent, you need to want to go through that in order to achieve whatever your goal is. Yeah, and sometimes you don't know that you want to go yeah, through it, yeah. right? And sometimes the 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 factor that keeps you coming to practice, even when you hate the cold water, even when you're sore because this is your ninth or tenth practice of the week and you gotta get in on a Saturday morning after staying up a little late on when on Friday night because you went to your friend's birthday party or you went out to see a movie and you got in at eleven, right? And now you got up at six to make seven practice. And so you're low on sleep. You're a little bit tired. You're a lot tired because it's your last practice of the week. And you show up and it's who knows, maybe it's Labor Day or Memorial Day and it's you're getting Monday off, right? And your and your and your coach like dogs on you and just like says, "Well, this is my last chance for the next two days, so here it is." And you're like, "Oh my god!" Like, don't you realize how tired I am? And 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 figuring out how do you get to the end of that practice, still giving everything that you have, physically and mentally and emotionally. Um, that's the trick, right? And. Um, and the truth is, is that a lot of times you have to play games with yourself in your own head during practice with the other kids during practice. Maybe it's joking with your coach during practice, even if they're not willing to be joked with like, but we have to figure out a way to have fun in the middle of the misery. Otherwise, like the misery just takes over. So I think having good friends on the team is massive. Having people that are just as committed to you. Um, as you are to them so that, you know, you know, like when you get up at four fifty in the morning on a Friday morning, after having done this three other times, you know, this week to make 5 a.m. practice, like the reason I got out of bed most mornings is because I knew Eddie and Timmy, you know, and Sarah and Heidi and Lisa were going to be there. Right. Not because I really wanted to be there, but because I knew that if I didn't show up, I would be robbing them of an opportunity to race and have somebody to be along for the journey with. And I didn't want to let them down that way. So a lot of times that's what kept me coming back in those really dark times. Um, you know, and I, I like to tell this story. There's, there's a fun story, um, you know, where, you know, I showed up on the first day, uh, the first Memorial Day, and we went a 5,000 for time. And I was like, I think I was 14. I'm like, y you're kidding, right? And like, nope, 500 warm up. And then he's like, all right, 5,000 for time. And of course, nobody else on the team said anything, but they all just grin on their face like, ah, the newbie doesn't know what we're doing today. And, um, and man, I pushed off. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. This is the worst practice and the worst set I've ever had in my life, which of course, that's what it's intended to do, right? How do you get over it mentally? This is not a physical effort as much as it is a mental effort, how, a effort, how do you get your head around it? And so I didn't see it as that, I didn't see it as that challenge at the time, but I was always one of those guys where I learned early on to be like, 
if somebody gave me the worst practice or the worst set I've ever had in my life that I didn't think I was going to make, or it was going to be so boring or horrible, my first reaction was to go, "Woo! All right, here we go." You know, but that that the the those two notes, "Woo!" Like is a little bit sarcastic, right? But it's also a little bit like. All right, dude. Like, yeah. here we go. A little like, positive self-talk. It's like a mental cue. <laughs> yes. Like you said, game yes, on. Yes. And so, like, so I think I did that. And I was like, so I push off. And I'm kind of, uh, first 500. And then I flip at the 450. We're swimming long course. I flip at the 450. And I push off the wall. And I roll left. And Tim Dewar, who's two years older than me, he's in next lane to me. And he rolls right. So we're looking at each other, right, as we roll off. And he sticks out his tongue as we're doing this. And I'm like, dude, you're clearly not trying hard enough if you're sticking out your tongue. So I'm like, let's go. So I start going a little faster. He starts going a little faster. Man, by the time we hit like 1,000, we're humming along. So I do my turn at like 1,050. No Timmy. Like, where did he go? I'm like, that guy, God, he... He starts going faster a thousand, then he gets out to go pee, you know, is what I was thinking. So I turn at the 1100 and who has moved over and is drafting off me, but Timmy, he thought that was hilarious, right? He hadn't gotten out. He had just, just switched lanes. So then for like the next 4,000 meters, it's game on. And now I'm in his lane and then he moves over to get behind me. And then I'm passing somebody in his lane when somebody else is coming to try and brush him off my tail. Like... The coach would have stopped us and made us start doing butterfly if we hadn't been going fast. We were swimming as hard and as fast as we could, but playing cat and mouse for the last 4,000 meters of the race. And finished with that, and like, well, that, was, that wasn't that bad. It's kind of fun, you know? And you can create fun out of misery or you can create more misery out of misery. So it's, 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 that's the mental game. And I think that's what you should remember when you have like the worst set in the world that your coach ever gives you is that it's probably more about your head than it is, you know, about what's going on physically. Yeah, you always have the power to make it better. Yes, you do. So um, I think that's a, a massive message that I don't know if we touched on. Um, and then maybe the other, and then coming back to the parent thing, um, you know, I think the parent's role is to support the parent's role is to say, you know, I have so much fun watching you swim. You know, I had the best time today and letting that, that criticism come from maybe another Avenue. Cause the odds are they're either criticizing themselves enough in their own heads. God knows I was right. And God knows Jack is right. Um, and they're, or they're getting it from their coach. So I think that that's really important as a parent and something that I've learned. Um, but having watched numbers and numbers, dozens of amazingly talented athletes like get pushed too hard by their parents, I mean, uh, it, it brings tears to my eyes thinking about people who would have been national team members, Olympic team members, that at 12 or 13 years old were getting pushed so hard by their parents that they were like... One thing I can control is whether I come here or not. So guess what? Peace out, you know? And I think that's the important thing is to figure out your kids and their motivations. And, um, you know, my, my mom's motivation came when I was like 10 years old. And I, it was cold on one of those days I told you about in November. I was trying to make it to the trophy meet. And I thought, I really don't want to swim today. So mom and dad, mom dropped me off. I went into the locker room, stayed there. And the hot showers until the end of practice. Never came out, never let coach see me. And then I tried to sl- sneak out. Of course, the kids said something to the coach, right? And you found out about it. My mom found out and I got in trouble. Oh, I'm sorry, mom. You know, and then like the next week, same thing, right? It's cold. So I thought, ah, I'll nip this one in the bud. So I said, mom, it's really, really cold today at practice. I don't want to go. I'll go tomorrow, but I don't want to go today. And she looked at me and I was like two weeks out. And we've been training from like August till November, right? And she knew how much I had put in. I had two weeks left. And she goes, okay, you don't have to go, but you can't ever go back again. Now, I wouldn't recommend that for like most 9, 10, 11-year-olds, whatever I was, okay? But my mom, I think, had a beat on me, and she knew. And she didn't say, you have to go, but she let it be up to me right? How much do you care about this? Is this something you really, you know, are passionate about? Does it mean enough to you? 
And it was a really crazy lesson to teach a 10 or 11 year old, but it worked, man. Right? Like I never, never, ever after that said, I don't want to go to practice. It was like, okay, this is what I love to do. This is what I'm good at. It stinks today, but I got to figure out a way through it. So um, parents, there may be times when you have to provide a nugget, but it's not a cram down. She didn't say, oh no, you're going, mister. Because that would have had the opposite effect. Um, so, um, you know, I think the parent's role is massive and it's in support. But if your kid is going to be great, you have to, it's going to come from within them. And I tell their parents, I tell the parents when they ask me, is, is, is Danny going too much to practice? He's swimming 10 practices a week. My, my, my question back to them is, is he having fun? You know? Yeah, yeah, he's having fun. Like, he's the one asking me. He wants to go to 12 practices a week. Okay. Then you know what? Maybe tap the brakes and, you know, make sure he doesn't go to 12. But, you know, like 9, 10? Sure, let him go to 9, 10. Not a big deal, you know? And let them provide that motivation if they want to go and provide the window for them to step back a little bit to find themselves and 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 uh, recharge if when they need that. But your role is to support, um, not to push. Those are two different things. It's definitely a lot of wisdom that I got to put down in my yeah. notebook for 10 years <laughs> down the road. <laughs> But thank you for coming out and chatting for the last couple of hours. Yeah, it's been say, fun. You've done an outstanding job. You're either really well trained or just a natural speaker or both. Oh man, it was hard. It was hard. The first class I signed up for after the Olympics was public speaking. Good for you. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks for having me and thanks for doing this. You know, I think it's important um, to to have real conversations and not just uh, thirty second snippets uh, with people about you know, about the, the things that they learned in life and the, and the things that they can really add. Context is so important. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's great too, that you can put something out there and have it unfiltered and let the audience make up their own mind about it. Yeah. That, yeah. And the sport of swimming needs a little more attention. <laughs> Always needs more attention. Always. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks for coming. See yeah. you at practice. Cheers.